My name is Hugh Williams. It is the 18th day of August in 2016, and I'm here in the Lincoln Room of the Law Library at the University of Southern California. I'm here to interview Len Adelman for the Turing Award Winners Project. Hello, Len. Um, you. I'm going to uh, ask you a series of questions uh, about your life. Uh, they'll be divided up roughly into about three parts. Your mm -hmm. early life, uh, your accomplishments, and uh, some reminiscing that you might like to do with regard okay. to that. So let me begin with your early life and I uh, ask you to tell me a bit about your ancestors, uh, where they came from, what they did, say right. up to the time you were born. Up to the time I yes. was born. Right. What I know about my ancestors is that my father, uh, my father's father, was born somewhere in modern day Belarus, the Minsk area, and uh, was Jewish, uh, came to the United States probably in the 1890s. Uh, my father was born in 1919 in New Jersey, and uh, he grew up in the Depression, uh, hopped freight trains across the country and came to California. And uh, my mother is sort of an unknown. The only thing we know about my mother's ancestry is uh, a birth certificate because my mother was born in 1919 and she was an orphan and it's not clear that she ever met her parents. Uh, but the birth certificate is enough to pr guess that she also came from modern day Belarus and also of Jewish uh, origin. And she was born in San Francisco. And they met uh, when uh, my father, according to the lore of my family, when my father approached her at a dance and said, asked her to dance and said that if she didn't dance well, he would leave her on the floor. Which, knowing my father, I, I suspect that could have happened. Uh, at any rate, uh, so I was born in 1945, in particular uh, December 31st of 1945. And uh, it was kind of an interesting time to be born because when I was conceived, there were no uh, computers in the world. When I was conceived, there were no atomic weapons in the world. And certainly it would be maybe 10 years before there were any satellites in the world. And so uh, it was a low tech compared to today era. And if I may go on a little bit about this, okay. So um, an interesting thing was that I was born in 1945 and though television had existed uh, before that experimentally and a little bit commercially in New York City, it came to San Francisco in 1948 and uh, uh, when it came to San Francisco, and it was a new technology, they didn't know where to sell it. That is, there was no uh, you know, Best Buy to go to to acquire a television. And so they decided they would sell it in appliance stores. Appliance stores were places where they sold like toasters and mixers and things like that. And my dad worked in an appliance store. And so even though we were sort of maybe lower middle class economically and could never have afforded this high tech thing called a television, uh, because my dad worked in an appliance store, he was able to get his hands on one. And he brought it home when I was like probably three or four. And uh, it was a little black and white mm -hmm. machine and its screen was about the size of our video, uh, you know, our mm -hmm. cell phones now. Yeah. And so, uh, and, and he also brought home this huge glass, magnifying glass, that you set in front of this little screen and uh, it made the picture bigger. Did nothing for the resolution, but it, you know, it deceived us into thinking we were seeing more. And so I consider myself uh, sort of on the very cusp of high tech. So ever since my time, 
every kid who's born is, you know, plunked in front of, at a very young age, some electronic device, like a television. Today, it's more likely that it's a computer. And, uh, but I got plunked in front of it um, when I was like three. So I began to take in this information that was being broadcast and not learning in the you know, traditional ways. Mm. So what you, can you tell me some of your earliest memories? Wow, my earliest memories. It's so strange because I think my earliest memories uh, may never have occurred. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, they've, they've sort of got lost in time. Uh, the earliest thing I can vividly remember was going to Golden Gate Park. I lived like uh, less than a quarter of a mile from Golden Gate Park. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was at Golden Gate Park, I went to a place called Stowe Lake. And I remember getting lost at Stowe Lake. I was, Stowe Lake had a lot of trees and sort of foresty areas around it. And I remember being lost there and being very fearful. Uh, I lost track, I think it was, of my brother. And uh, so it's a vivid memory I have, but I'm not sure I didn't dream it. <laughs> but it's probably the earliest recollection of any, you know, sort of image of me when I was young. And that would be it, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. you tell me about your siblings, if you have any. Yeah. I have a brother, Ronald. He was three years older than me. And uh, he was tall and I was short. And I always admired his uh, name, Ronald J. Adelman. And I thought I got stuck with Leonard Max Adelman and wasn't anywhere near as good. He was a pretty good athlete. He was a very handsome guy. Uh, and uh, um, I don't know, he took me a lot of places, but I'm not, I'm not sure. He, he would take me to Golden Gate Park. Uh, we grew up together, we spent a lot of time together, but I always was the tag along with, with his friends. And really, Ron has grown to be one of the most important people in my life, only probably in the last maybe 15 years, in which case he, since then, uh, he's become invaluable to me as somebody to talk to, somebody to confide in, uh, to learn from. So I, I love him a bunch. What education did he have? Yeah, well, his education actually is interesting because um, he uh, went to high school, graduated. Then he uh, uh, went to what was then called S uh, San Francisco State College, mm -hmm. which was a what we would call, uh, which now call Cal State. Oh, excuse me. He first went to a junior college for a few years. And then he went to uh, San Francisco State College. And by then, it was sort of the emerging 1960s, uh, the 1963, mid-60s, mm -hmm. where the you know, social, cultural, sex, drugs, and rock and roll burst onto the mm -hmm. scene. And San Francisco was sort of a hotbed of it. And uh, so he got a degree in English, not because he knew anything about English. Uh, in fact, as I recall, the only book he had read, uh, perhaps until he graduated, was either the Babe Ruth story or Black Beauty, okay? But what he could do is he could write this wonderful stream of consciousness poetry, and that, was in vogue, and the professors at Cal State North, uh, Cal State uh, San Francisco liked that, so he graduated. And then he, um, he later got a degree or a credential in mathematics and became a teacher of mathematics in San Francisco. Okay. Mm -hmm. now, can you tell me how about your mother's education? What did she do? I think that my mother was largely, uh, she wasn't. Uh, I don't even know if she graduated from high school. She, she was brought up in an orphanage and in, uh, you know, foster homes. So her life wasn't, you know, very stable. Uh, what she did was she um, 
mostly was a housewife, a mother to my brother and myself, uh, but she also worked, and she worked in retail sales uh, during uh, seasonal kind of work, Christmas sales, and, uh, and she also worked as a bookkeeper and, uh, for private companies and then later for Bank of America. Uh, <clears throat> were there any others in your family that went on to higher education? Mm, no, I think that is my family, that is. Okay. as best I know it. What was your favorite subject in school? Yeah, well, uh, I, I didn't have a favorite subject in school, not in, for a very long time. Uh, it was always, math was always easy for me, you know, that, that was clear. Uh, but I didn't, I was, uh, in my own view, amazingly naive and oblivious to myself and my future. I didn't know anything. And, and uh, uh, so I just went to class because you had to go to class. And uh, I was the kind of kid that would get called into the office with my parents. And they'd explain how on the state tests, you know, I was doing very well, but I wasn't living up to my potential, right? But I didn't care. And so uh, a real, I had no favorite topic, uh, but, but a real turning point for me was when I took as a junior or a senior a Shakespeare class. And it was taught by this brilliant and wonderful teacher whose name, regrettably, I forget. And uh, it was the first time in my life that I realized that there could be something beyond the superficial that there could be a deeper intellectual world to explore. And, uh, and this woman had a huge effect on my life because uh, one day she called me up and said, Leonard, I'd like to talk to you. And I said, yes, miss. And she said, uh, what are you going to do after you graduate from high school? And I said, I don't know. I guess I'll go to City College because my brother went to City College, you know. I never thought about these things. She said, uh, why don't you go to Berkeley instead? And I said, okay. <laughs> that was it. Just like that. Just like that, you know, because I, I was very obedient, but I seemed to lack context, you know. I didn't see a big picture. Yeah. <laughs> okay. do, you, do you remember a subject that you really hated in school? Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I do. German. Okay. So... At that time, in high school, you were forced to take several years of German. And then later, in, at Berkeley, I was forced to take several years of German. And so I probably took German for six or seven years because uh, when I got to college, I'd always have to drop out of the class because I was failing it, right? And, and in fact, after six or seven years, I don't think I knew any more German than I knew after, you know, the first two weeks, right? And I faked my way through all of the German classes that I managed to pass, right? And, uh, um, yeah, and, and I resented it because I thought that, why am I being forced to do these things which have no purpose in my life? You know, I know I'm not going to become a German scholar, right? Who cares? There's, you know two or three hundred different languages that are currently spoken, probably more. Um, why this one? Why does it matter? You know, why am I forced to suffer through this? And uh, uh, yeah, so, so yes, I, I hated German. Okay. Mm -hmm. Tell me a bit about growing up. What did you like to do as a kid? Yeah, um, I think I just existed. You know, I... Um, my parents would work. I'd get on the bus. I'd go to school. I'd come home. I'd uh, go to the television, as I've been taught at a very early age. Uh, and uh, I just did what I was told and what was available, and life just flowed by me. Uh, I was kind of a voyeur in life. I would watch things around me, but I wasn't much of a participant. 
uh, you know, where other kids in high school were maybe getting cool and socializing with mm -hmm. girls and everything. You know, I was still sitting there just sort of looking around and eating my peanut butter sandwich. <laughs> Wasn't a very interesting kid. What did people say about you? Oh, but, but well, one thing did go on. Uh, because of that little television, which later became bigger, uh, I started to watch programs like Mr. Wizard. Okay, and several times in my life there's been these very influential people, uh, the, the Shakespeare teacher, but mm -hmm. Mr. Wizard too. So I would get up early before school and I would watch Mr. Wizard who would teach us all sorts of things scientific. So I am one of the few people in the world who understands how to take a hard-boiled egg and get it inside of a, of a milk bottle, right? I know this because Mr. Wizard taught me, right? So I, I was becoming, you know, fascinated with science and all of these things. And so uh, that was part of my life. I, I did early on like science, you know. What, what, when precisely what was that? I mean, when did you realize that you, you liked science? I don't think I realized it. I just did. I just started to watch these programs. And I, I suspect this would have been uh, mid-50s. You know, maybe I'm 10 years old or something like that. But I like science, and so I start doing little experiments and things. You already talked about an English teacher that you liked. Yeah. Uh, were there any other teachers that, uh, as well that you liked in school who, who helped or inspired you? Well, uh, up to high school, the one that stands out is this Shakespeare teacher. But of course, after that, there were a lot of teachers that, that inspired me. Uh, not necessarily formal teachers at school, but uh, one of the great inspirations of my life uh, was really Martin Gardner. Okay. And I see you, you know, acknowledging that because for mathematicians of our generation, Martin Gardner inspired, it's got to be 50% of us, mm -hmm. all right? And uh, so Martin Gardner wrote a column for Scientific American, and it was called the Mathematical Games column. And he did such a brilliant job. He wasn't a mathematician himself, mm -hmm. but he could, uh, you know, expose us to mathematics in a way that we who weren't mathematicians could understand and intrigue us and he would ask questions for us to ponder. And it was just so inspirational and there were two Martin Gardner uh, articles by now sort of grown up that, that came out that, that had a profound effect on me. One was the game of life which virtually every mathematician mm -hmm. has encountered and uh, okay and so it, it, it was this strange sort of uh, dynamic game that uh, uh, consisted of moving tiles along a very large uh, uh, essentially checkerboard uh, according to certain little local rules and uh, but it was fascinating uh, it, it later became called cellular automata as a theory and uh, I found it fascinating. And by that time, uh, I was between my undergraduate and graduate degrees, and I was working at the Federal Reserve Bank in San Francisco as a computer guy. Okay. So uh, Martin Gardner asked, because uh, he always asked these uh, questions at the end, you know, what happens to the particular arrangement constellation of tiles called the arpentomino. Not too important, but mm -hmm. what happened to it? And uh, so the way to find out what happened to it was to play the life game starting with that configuration, except that you would die before you ever got to the answer, unless you had a really big computer, right? And no one had really big computers because no one had a personal computer, right? The only big computers were in large institutions, often government, and things like the Federal Reserve Bank, where they were kept in special rooms and, you know, with air conditioning and all sorts of stuff going on. And not many people had access to them. But I, I did because I worked there. And so uh, 
I thought it was a good use of the, you know, the federal tax dollar <laughs> to find out what happened to the R pentomino. And so I went in and used those computers to find out the destiny of the R pentomino, right? And I found out what it does, its destiny, and I wrote to Martin Gardner what its destiny was. I think along with a computer printout to show that it wasn't just a guess or something. And, uh, and then the next uh, Scientific American that came out, uh, there listed among the 10 people who had figured out the destiny of the R. pentomino was me. Me, I, you know, and this was the first time my name had ever print. You know, I'd made a mark on the world, right? You know, I had meant something in some crazy, you know, way. And so that was one very influential thing in my life, Martin Gardner did. The other thing he did was he had written an article on girdling completeness. And uh, girdling completeness is a mathematical result. It's done by Girdle and it's based on work by um, Tarski and other great mathematicians like Church and Turing of the 1930s. Uh, and uh, it's a mathematical result about the nature of truth in mathematics and our ability to apprehend it, to get our hands on it. And the answer is, well, we can't get our hands on all of it. In fact, we can get our hands on very little of it. And so it, it's extremely profound. It's when mathematics sort of transcends itself and has something grandly philosophical to say. And I was intrigued by that result. I was still at the Federal Reserve Bank, I think, when it happened, uh, when he wrote that article. And I said to myself, you know what? If I go back to graduate school, I'm going to learn about one of these great, great things you know, these mysterious things. I'm going to learn, you know, girdle incompleteness, or I'm going to learn about black holes, or I'm going to learn about, you know, many worlds in quantum mechanics, things like that, these bizarre, or relativity, right? I'm going to learn about one of these for real, not just as a, you know, cocktail party discussion. Mm -hmm. I'm going to learn what it's really doing. And, uh, and I later did that, and it had a profound effect on my life. Okay. Yeah. Did you have any mentors when you started higher education? Well, what happened was when uh, Martin Gardner did that game of life thing, uh, and I had found out the des mysterious destiny of the R pentomino, uh, I became interested in the cellular automata. And there was a woman who worked at the Federal Reserve Bank uh, who was, had gone, done some graduate work in mathematics. And she had, and so I was thinking about these cellular automata and I produced a sort of mathematical result. And she helped me write it up. She said, you know, well, this is what, you know, how you say this in mathematics language. And that was the first paper I ever produced. And, and I submitted it to a conference. I think it was Fox or Stock in the very early. And it got rejected out of hand, <laughs> you know. But she, but I, now I was a little bit interested in this stuff. And she was friends with Lenore Blum, a mathematician, yes. mm -hmm. who was married to Manuel yes. Blum. And she said, well, you know, maybe what you should do is go to graduate school at Berkeley and work with Manuel Blum. Mm. And just like, you know, that Shakespeare teacher, go to Berkeley, okay. She said, and I said, okay. And that's what I did too. You know. So Martin Gardner had a profound effect, and later on he was to have a third profound effect on, yes. on me. We'll get to that. Yeah. <laughs> do you recall any textbooks that might have been important to you when you were in university? Ooh, boy, do I ever. Okay. So uh, the textbook is uh, a book on theory of computation or Automata or something, an early theoretical computer science textbook by, I think it was Aho and Ullman. Mm -hmm. Okay, but, but here's the story of that. And, uh, okay, and this doesn't tell short. You know, this story doesn't tell short, but I'll try to keep it as short as I can. Okay, so I'm struggling. I got my bachelor's degree. 
I'm thinking, what am I going to do with my life? And I had tried out chemistry, and I was thinking about maybe math. But I said, well, I never really tried physics. And after all, they had relativity and black holes and all sorts of cool stuff. So what I'll do is I'll go to Cal State University, San Francisco, then called San Francisco State, and I'll try out physics. Uh, so I did that. I went and signed up for like four or five classes in physics while I'm still working at the Federal Reserve Bank. I sign up for them all, and I start taking physics. And like four or five weeks go by, and one day I find myself in this lab, and I'm shining light through lenses, and I'm measuring you know, where the light falls. And I'm supposed to be rediscovering you know, the refraction laws or whatever it was. And I'm sitting there doing that, and I stop and I say, I hate this. I'm not going to spend my life doing this. Now, you know, I was naive because I was seeing just one part of the elephant, right? You know, there's the magnificent parts of physics, but that was what I thought physics was. And I said, I'm out. I'm done with this. And I left. Didn't withdraw from the university, didn't do anything, just said, I'm not going anymore. So then when I reflect more and this stuff about the game of life and this interest in the uh, girdle and everything is, is around, I say, you know, I think I'll try, as Linda said, to go back to Berkeley and work with Manuel Blum. Okay. So I decide I'm going to do that. But then I think, wow, Berkeley's a state school and San Francisco State is a state school. And I withdrew from all these classes without telling anybody. I probably got four or five Fs sitting there, right? And so I thought, that could haunt me. That could keep me out of Berkeley. And so I went back to Berkeley, and I went into the library, and I checked out Aho and Ullman, and I stole it. I, I... I checked it out with the intent of never returning it, and I never did, okay? And I did that because I knew the following. I knew that since when people leave a university, there's no conceivable way that they're, you know, missing books from the library, their library fines and all these things will ever get paid. There's no leverage except one, mm -hmm. and the leverage is they won't release your transcripts. And since my transcripts were, you know, four or five Fs, that suited me fine, right? So I stole that book on purpose. But there's a little sort of addendum to this story, which I think is kind of charming. So, but I was, I was um, troubled by this. You know, I felt guilty for years because I'd stolen this book. You know, I didn't like stealing and, you know, I wasn't comfortable. Mm -hmm. So one day, like 20 years later, uh, Gina Colada, who's a uh, writer for the New York Times, is interviewing me. And, she, and this story comes up about you know, my stealing a book on purpose you know, to keep the transcripts. From coming. So, she, you know, and I discuss it a little informally with her. And she says, and I said, I, you know, I felt guilty ever since. And she said, well, why don't you just send them some money, you know, to take care of it? And I said, you know, I've thought of that many times, but by God, I'm going to do it. So I sit down and I write a check for, I think, $100 or $200. And I mail it to the library at San Francisco State. And in those days, checks had... Uh, all sorts of personal information on them, including phone numbers and things. So some days later, I get a call, and uh, it's a representative of the library. And she says, um, you know, we want to thank you for the generous donation. Uh, is there any particular type of book that you would like to you know, get with this gift? I said, well, yeah, you know, math books and computer science books would be appropriate. I could like that. And she says, and, and I should have known, you know, if you just send people 
couple of hundred dollars out of the blue, they're likely to want to talk to you more, mm -hmm. right? So she said, well, you know, why did you send this to us in the first place? And I said, well, it's really a, a strange story, but if you want to know it, by coincidence, there's a, an article in the New York Times, I think it was the very day she called, that'll explain why I, I took a book once. So she thanked me, and then later, you know, maybe a couple of weeks later, I get a, a letter from the head of the universe, uh, of the library at San Francisco State College. And he explains, thanks me for the gift, and he, he explains that he had read the New York Times article. And though he had no aspirations to religious uh, life, uh, he hereby absolved me <laughs> of guilt. <laughs> I still have the letter. So that's the most important book in my life. I see. Yeah. <laughs> now tell me about your current family, your children. Yeah. Spouse. I got three children, uh, Jenny, Lindsay, and Stephanie. Uh, Jenny is currently working at Harvard. Uh, Lindsay works at LinkedIn. And Stephanie lives with me. And uh, uh, they're the most important thing in my life. Just that's all I can say about it. And wonderful, you know. Uh, beyond that, I, uh, with, with women, I've been married twice, divorced twice. I've had maybe three long-term relationships. Um, and uh, women have been great. They were all wonderful women. And, uh, and uh, yeah, big part of my life. Uh, now my personal life beyond that, uh, yeah. Well, I spend a lot of time doing research still, but um, I also spend a lot of time uh, with friends. And uh, I also uh, exercise quite a lot. I work out maybe four or five times a week. And um, I, I find that very beneficial for a variety of reasons, uh, not the least of which is psychological. So I, I work out, I take boxing lessons. And uh, um, I've been doing it for maybe 10 plus years. And uh, that's really a wonderful part of my life because um, um, I take boxing lessons with a, a trainer. His name's Shadid Saluki. He has trained many world champions, including heavyweight world champions. And, uh, and he, you know, is nice. He's my friend now. Uh, nice enough to train me while he's training these, you know, champions. And so I get to hang around with these incredible athletes, right? <laughs> you know, uh, that uh, all of whom could kill me, you know, in a matter of seconds. Uh, but, but they're wonderful people. And so I have these two groups of people, you know, my, my young students, PhD students, which I still have, or free, previous students, which I do research with. And, you know, I get to see them develop intellectually, but also, you know, I like to keep track of their lives and, you know, give them whatever wisdom I might have. But then there's these young guys who are boxers, and I get to know them, and it's, it's much the same process, though I can't teach them. Shadid does. So that's been wonderful for me. Do you have any other hobbies or activities that you enjoy? Let's see. I, I read. Um, I listen to music. Um, I watch sports on television. Um, I'm not much of an outgoing person. I don't, you know, go to plays and the like. Uh, yeah. But... Uh, those are, th those are pretty much the things I do. Mm -hmm. uh, then just one final question in this section. Mm -hmm. do you ever change, have you ever changed careers or shift from one major area to another? And if uh, so, why? Yeah, I've done that several times. And um, I've done it, I think, for a variety of reasons. Um, I certainly started out as a number theorist and an algorithmic number theorist in particular. But I shifted at one point 
uh, into a biological sort of thing. And this happened when I was probably in my 40s, mid-40s. And I guess, I guess I thought at that time that these talents that mathematicians have, I mean, we're really good at some things. I mean, we are the world champions in concentration. I mean, everybody can concentrate. But, you know, I can concentrate on the same problem 16 hours a day when I'm not eating or, you know, have other obligations for years in a row. And I'll be so concentrated that I could be startled by somebody, you know, saying my name and stuff. We're good at that. And I thought maybe these are talents that I could apply in other areas. And so when I started thinking this, HIV was a big thing. Mm -hmm. So I started to investigate HIV. And I found it really interesting because it taught me something about mathematicians. You know, we're so good at what we do in, you know, rigorous logical thinking and intensity um, that it hardly matters what we are thinking about. Those skills still, you know, will serve us well. And so I found that I, if I just got a medical dictionary to understand the words that, you know, researchers in, in biology were using, uh, I could read their literature immediately and think about it. And, uh, and I could think about it in the way mathematicians think about it. And so it led me to a theory of the pathogenesis of HIV, how, how it becomes, you know, causes us damage. And uh, the, uh, the HIV world uh, never really nurtured my theory. I tried very hard uh, to get them to do it and uh, uh, did some experiments in animals and things, you know, as a collaborator to try to get my theory. Uh, I still believe in my theory. I think I'm right. Uh, but it was a big disappointment in my life uh, when I did that. Uh, but it, it led to something different. Uh, you know, the journey starts in one direction, but it mm -hmm. ends up someplace else. And uh, what happened was, in order to be able to speak better and be heard by the HIV uh, paradigm setters. I thought it'd be good if I learned molecular biology and virology. And so one time I, um, I went into, I, I, I asked a USC associated molecular biologist, virologist, if I could spend a summer in his lab. And so I went into his lab and, uh, and biology was not what I expected it to be. I expected it to be things that smelled bad in refrigerators, right? And what happened was it was all about A, T, C, and G. Mm -hmm. You know, geez, you know, words over a four-letter alphabet. I got it, right? <laughs> you know? And, and uh, so I looked at it that way. And, and since I was looking at it one way, they were looking at it very differently. And uh, so I started doing experiments which were really mathematically based um, with the tools of molecular biology. And there were a couple of experiments, but one of them uh, in particular was I realized one day that, um, well, maybe we should take a break and I, before I go into this. Uh, now, with regard to the DNA thing, I'm in this laboratory and Everybody's viewing what's going on from a biological standpoint, the way they had learned to view it, you know, and successfully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I didn't see it that way at all. I saw the cell as doing computations, you know, based on these words over a four-letter alphabet, right? And I, I start, my goal was to learn some molecular biology. And I'm reading a, a well-known book, the, uh, I think it's, well, it doesn't matter. I'm reading a book one day, 
And there's this wondrous little molecule. It's a protein. It's called polymerase. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, I'm reading about it. And what polymerase does is it jumps onto a strand of DNA. And it's like a juggler on a tightrope. And it walks down the strand and it reads the A, T, C's, and G's. And if it's walked forward onto the next letter, it reads it and it reaches out into the solution around itself and grabs a corresponding letter and then attaches that to a growing strand of DNA that it's building. Mm -hmm. And then it takes another step forward, grabs another molecule based on what it's standing on, adds it. And by this, this mechanism, this little protein, uh, that's how DNA reproduces. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of the, the centerpiece of life because if DNA, if polymerase didn't produ reproduce DNA, then cells wouldn't reproduce and we wouldn't reproduce, right? It's where life happens. And it's, it's about two nanometers in every direction. And it does this incredible stuff. But from my point of view, here was this string of letters, the DNA, and this little machine that was walking along it, making new strings of letters. Well, you know, to anybody who grew up with my intellectual background, it was a Turing machine. That's what Turing machines were. That's what Turing, that's what the first conceptual real computers were. And, uh, and so I remember I sat up in bed, because I was reading it in bed, and I said to my wife, I said, these things can compute. And so at that moment, I knew that they could compute. And so I said, well, you know, why don't I run an experiment during the summer where I'll get them to compute something? And so I designed an experiment. Uh, it didn't work just like a Turing machine, but I knew that the tools of molecular biology would make, th these tools would give me universality in the sense of Turing. I could compute whatever I wanted with DNA and these proteins. You know, I could balance a checkbook or fly to Mars, but I chose to, um, to do something called the, uh, uh, Hamiltonian path problem. Mm -hmm. And so I sat in the lab and I did this experiment with the tools of molecular biology. And, you know, basically in a drop of water, a computation took place. And it took place by interacting molecules. Those were the operations. And, it, uh, and I did the experiment and I did all the work and I got the answer. I mean, that is, it worked. Mm -hmm. I did find the Hamiltonian path. And uh, it was a small example. But I, uh, I said, well, uh, what am I gonna, you know, I'll write it up as a paper. Where should I submit it? Well, I didn't know anything about the biological world, right? You know, of where you submit these things. So the only thing I knew that would accept papers like this was science, right? Mm -hmm. So I sent it off to science and you know, I didn't know. I, th I reject it, whatever. And, uh, and it turned out that the reviews came back, you know, with words like, you know, you know, just, just superlatives, right? And I said, wow, that's surprising. And so, uh, and it became a paper and uh, people liked it. And uh, it launched a field called DNA computing. And uh, that field's still alive and thriving. Uh, two of the students I worked with who were attracted to this field, uh, Paul Rodeman and Eric Winfrey, uh, now are at Caltech and they do this. And uh, they both won MacArthur Awards. And uh, they're wonderful and brilliant at it. And uh, it's sort of where computer science meets biology, and, uh, and it, 
ideally it gives us a you know new way of looking at biology and computation. That's a nice segue into your accomplishments, which is the next part oh, of okay. my selection of questions here. Yeah. So let me begin with, uh, uh, can you describe the computing field? What, what, what was it like when you first entered it? Yeah, we, when I first entered it, uh, it was like 1972 or something. And uh, we were sort of not widely accepted by mathematicians. Uh, mathematicians who, you know, were proving theorems and, uh, and the like were um, viewed us as not doing very good stuff. And in fairness to them, I think they were largely right. You know, you don't get uh, accepted into a discipline that's been around for 2,000 years or more, in fact, more, uh, you know, just because you, you played with some numbers or you did a little something here or there, a bunch of ad hoc results, right? There was no theory there. There was no profound thing there. Um, and so uh, when I entered the field, there was sort of a curse and a blessing. One is we were not accepted by our peers. Uh, the other thing was we were a hot topic, okay? There were actually positions available in the world. You could get a job, which unlike the mathematicians, you know, who couldn't, right? <laughs> so so uh, it, it, when I entered the field, it, it was a, a blessing because I could get a nice job. Uh, but, but it was also the perfect time to enter the field. So as you know, Hugh, because we worked in the same area, um, uh, what happened was, and this is true of many disciplines, they, they burn brightly for a little while, some point in history, mm -hmm. and then they don't burn as brightly and they're kept alive by a sort of priesthood or cadre of individuals who you know, keep them, the ember burning from generation to generation and then they flare up occasionally, right? And then they are embers again. And uh, that was true of algorithmic number theory. And it was in the ember state, you know, probably when Gauss was doing it, just because Gauss was doing it, it was in the, uh, you know, flare up state, all right? But, but there was a new wind blowing that would fan those fires, right? And that new wind was complexity theory. Mm -hmm. All right. So there were things going on a out of the, out of the uh, you know, Gauss and the people who worked on it, there had been this lineage of algorithmic number theory, which had passed through the Lamers, Derek Lamer Sr. and Derek Lamer Jr. And uh, they had developed all these incredibly good ideas for dealing with numbers and algorithms on numbers. And Derek Lamer Jr. was at Berkeley at the time. At the same time, there was a second trend that really goes back to Gödel and Turing and the like. And that was that uh, we could look at sets of numbers and wonder about a new feature they may or may not have, and that was decidability. Mm -hmm. uh, we could start to wonder whether a computer could know enough about this set of numbers to tell what was in it and what wasn't in it. So, you know, we can write computer programs that'll tell us of a number if it's even or odd, and we can write ones that can tell us whether it's prime or not prime, right? But, um, and the logicians taught us there are some sets of numbers where no computer program can do it. All right, They're, those are undecidable. And uh, so what had happened is that field, which was very important, uh, had developed, and it had developed sort of along two lines. One line was uh, to get more and more precise, l learn the tools to become more and pr more precise about which problems were on, on the decidable side and which were on the undecidable side. And uh, a particularly rich uh, thread of that was Helbert's 12th, 10th problem. And that had just gotten solved when I went back to graduate student by Yuri Matiasevich. 
And he had built on the work of Julia Robinson and Martin Davis and others. And uh, Julia was also a professor at Berkeley, right? And Julia was wonderful to me and my uh, graduate student colleagues. And she would um, call Maria Savich late in, you know, well, late at night for her time to, you know, transmit our questions and get answers about, you know, Maria Savich's work and tell us. And, uh, and then at the same time, real computers got invented. And so people started to care, not just whether a set of numbers was decidable or not, but whether, or not, uh, whether a computer could know which, was, whether, which numbers were in and which numbers were out, but whether they could do it fast. And fast be, became, theoretically, polynomial time, or not fast became not polynomial time. And, uh, and the great people in that field included Manuel Blum, my advisor, and incredibly inventive, wonderful person uh, who had started to make a theoretical basis for this. And Dick Karp was also at Berkeley who was starting to put together, these guys were putting together a theory, not just a bunch of ad hoc results, a theory of theoretical computer science. Okay, and so I was blessed by having all these three threads come at once. And uh, then one of my Manuel uh, Blum's other students was Gary Miller, and he was the first one to really pick up this thread mm -hmm. and start to bring these two separate developments, the number theoretic and the sort of computational together. And he produced this result on primality testing, which is a wonderful breakthrough result. And, uh, and so I was following his lead, and I became interested in number theory, and I became uh, enamored with number theory, and I began to love number theory, and I, you know, started reading number theory, and et cetera. And so that became the, the direction I took, and, and the wonderful thing about that was that the people in algorithmic number theory didn't have the, uh, you know, this guidance that polynomial time, stay away from subroutines that require non-polynomial time. Didn't have that, you know, but it was gifted to me. So I could go to, you know, the Lamer School and guys like you who had this vast warehouse of great ideas, and I could just sort of piece them together and get great stuff, right? <laughs> you know, so it was working great for me, you know, and, uh, and so, uh, and that together with the fact that, um, you know, people wanted computer scientists all of a sudden because there were computers, uh, at universities there were positions. And, you know, it meant that when I graduated, I could get a position at MIT. You know, so I, you know, so lucky. Yeah. <laughs> what was your first job? My very first job? Yeah. I think the first one I remember, oh, it was Paperboy. Oh, oh no! I mean, I mean within the within the context of, uh, of uh, academic the, ac the academy. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, well, uh, it was getting uh, to be uh, a professor at MIT in mathematics, right? Which is like, wow, what a great first job, right? So that was my first job. Okay. Yeah. What was your first computer? Ah, yeah, my first computer. Now this is another you interesting. Always remember your first. <laughs> yes, very good. But I, I have a first computer that's a, well, let me just tell the story. When I was at the Federal Reserve Bank, um, there were a bunch of very brilliant people there. One of them was a guy named Eth Ephraim Lipkin. And uh, Ephraim was never quite sure whether he was an anarchist or a communist, okay? And I, I, I asked him one day, well, you know, how do you reconcile your political beliefs with working at the Federal Reserve Bank, you know, the Federal Reserve Bank? And, and he said, oh, he didn't have a problem with that because he never planned to finish any project. There would never be a deliverable, <laughs> okay? So he and I used to use that big computer for all sorts of things, you know, trying to make music and all sorts of things. But he was a real visionary and, uh, and he lived in Berkeley, 
And uh, we would dream as we were using the Federal Reserve computer of actually having a computer of our own that we could have, right? And Ephraim, to a large extent, did it because he was part of a group of people and he had set up, gotten, they had gotten their hands on a, on a big computer, not a personal computer, but that they owned. And they set up the first sort of network where people on Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley could type in, hey man, need a ride to LA, oh, yeah. right? And there was another one at like Tower Records. And that computer would hook them up. This was really, you know, early, early put in together a network. I mean, this was really far out stuff, and he was really doing it, he and his friends. So one day I go over to Ephraim's house, and sitting on a desk is this thing that's about the size of a, you know, modern amplifier or FM thing. Yeah, maybe they're smaller now. Okay, and it's got a row of lights on it, and those lights are blinking, okay? And they're blinking in a way I walk up to it and I say, well, you know, it's clear this thing, these lights are counting in binary. And I said, Ephraim, what is this thing? And he says, Len, it's a computer. And, you know, computers were these big things at the Federal Reserve Banks with special air conditioning, wiring running all around, mm -hmm. spinning tape. It's a computer. I said, what? Okay. Turns out it was a computer. And it was the first personal computer. That is not the first, an example of the first computer, personal computer. It was the first individual personal computer. And what had happened is this guy who was part of Ephraim's network, who lived in Texas, had started to develop a kit called the Altar. And he had built himself a prototype you know, being a good guy, don't sell the kid unless you put it together yourself. He had made a prototype and he had sent it to Ephraim and his buddies in Berkeley. And that thing sitting on that desk was his prototype, okay? And that thing later, he and his buddies took it to show all their buddies at a big meeting, this computer. None of them had ever seen such a thing. I'd never seen such a thing, right? And then that group decided they would meet regularly. And they called themselves the Homebrew Computer Club. And, that, and that's when Jobs and Wozniak first saw a computer as well. It was that one. Wish I had that computer, huh? Yeah. So that was my f first experience with a personal computer. The first one I actually owned was some kind of early Apple thing. You know, very early Apple, yeah. You've talked about this a little bit, but uh, if you want to say a bit more about it, the projects, you, projects that you did work on in your early part of your career? Projects I worked on in the early part of my career? Yeah. You mean you... What sort of things did, were you... Were you uh, oh, well... I mean, you, you mentioned some already. Okay, but. well... In my early career, I, I was really in love with logic, computer science, and in particular, number theory. And like many mathematicians, and I was young, Gauss was my hero. And uh, so I was dedicated to this stuff. So I was working on algorithmic number theory, and in particular, primality testing, uh, because Gauss had said, and I'll only be able to paraphrase him, uh, you know, the problem of distinguishing prime numbers from composite numbers and factoring the, the latter is so famous and celebrated that it would be a waste of time to describe it here. And uh, um, the dignity of science requires a solution. Now, this is written in 1801 in Disquisitionis Arithmetica by the guy who is, you know, arguably, and I think most people would choose, as the greatest mathematician who ever lived. And he had written, the dignity of science requires a solution to this. Well, you know, that lit me up.
By the way, there's a footnote because you, Hugh, I think probably have read at least parts of Disquisiciones, mm -hmm. right? There's a footnote there wherein he says, oh, he, he goes on having described how important this problem is to then give what he considers a solution. Lovers of, of, of arithmetic, the word for number theory at the time, will find these following algorithms wonderful. Mm -hmm. And indeed they are wonderful, but they don't run in polynomial time. But he has a footnote there, and in that footnote he says, uh, the reader should be aware that as the numbers get bigger, the, these computations become more prolix. Okay? And in that one statement in 1801, He's saying that an algorithm has a complexity function associated with it. That's a function of the size of the input. The bigger the number, the more time it takes, right? So I've often thought that if, you know, Gauss had a spare weekend sometime, you know, and could have paid a little more attention to that, he could have launched computer science and complexity theory, you know, 150 years before it did get launched. And, you know, <laughs> the guy was off the charts. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. The, the citation for your uh, AM Turing Award is the following. Yeah. Together with Ronald Rivest and Adi Shamir for their ingenious contribution to making public key cryptography useful in practice. In fact, this investigation led to the establishment this is what I'm saying now. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was the citation. It's quite short. Mm -hmm. In fact, this investigation led to the establishment of the RSA cryptosystem. Yeah. And to, to, uh, I'll read another quote here. The most widely used encryption method with applications throughout the Internet to secure online transactions. What is public key cryptography and why is it so important? Okay. Uh, this goes back to Diffie and Hellman and sort of the history of cryptography. So cryptography, secret codes, have been around for thousands of years, and they've been very important in world events because people often want to send messages where they fear an enemy will get their hands on the message. And so they encrypt it, they scramble it, and it's decrypted on the other end. And uh, this has been used for thousands of years and often failed miserably uh, during many periods of time and led to great disasters and failures of nations and of, of rulers and all sorts of things. It's been an important thing in the history of the world. And, uh, uh, but Diffie and Hellman in like six, 76, 77, were thinking about this. And, and like sort of like Ephraim Lipkin, they were thinking about the future of the world and what computers and networks were going to mean to the world. And they foresaw a day when all sorts of internet commerce and medical records and everything would be flying through the air at the speed of light all over the world and all this stuff was going to go on. Uh, and they said, that's going to create security problems, privacy problems, right? And one way to try to keep things private was cryptography. So they investigated cryptography. But they realized the internet was not like historical uses of cryptography. In the historical use, you had a general and his lieutenants, and they met at headquarters, and they shared a key. And then when they were dispersed in the field, that key was used as a key to encrypt and decrypt the secret messages that would be transmitted. Uh, but they said, you know, once this big thing, which we, of course, now call the Internet, uh, happens, people are going to communicate with other people that they didn't know one minute before. They didn't share a key that, at headquarters because they're halfway around the world from one another, and they never knew each other existed until just now, but they have to send important private information, you know, classically credit card information, for example. Um, and they said, we can't do it that old way where they share a key, because they don't. Can we do it without them sharing a key so that we can transmit this secret information and someone listening on the line won't be able to read it? Well, it seemed impossible to do such a thing. And in fact, 
at that time, the, theory, the mathematical foundation for cryptography had become information theory. And information theory, due to Shannon, uh, actually you could prove you can't do such a thing, right? But they said, well, there's this new stuff about called computational complexity, and there's this P and NP and all these things. Maybe we can exploit that and make a new foundation for cryptography where you won't share a key and you can still communicate in private. And, you know, it's very visionary stuff. And so they produced a, uh, a paper on it, and uh, that's how public key cryptography was born and which is used invisibly to most users. Mm -hmm. All the time, anything's, you know, billions of times a day, I think. Can you tell us a bit about the work on RSA? Yeah. What inspired it? What well, what inspired it were? was, yeah, l I'll just tell the story okay. of RSA and my part in it. Um, so. Diffie and Hillman did indeed produce their, their paper, and mm -hmm. they were Stanford researchers. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ron Rivest got a copy of the paper. And uh, it could have been in, you know, it is before publication, I suspect, right? You know, mm -hmm. manuscript. And Ron, Adi Shamir, and I were all young professors at MIT, and we were friends, and we used to do everything together. You know, we'd go on trips together, we'd have dinners together, we did everything together, and we were constantly collaborating on our common discipline, which was computational complexity theory. And, uh, and we saw each other every day. And I remember the following story. Ron, I think, remembers all this differently, but, you know, Ron will be sitting here sometime and maybe you'll be opposite him, Hugh, uh, and you can correct his <laughs> mistakes on this history. Okay, so what happened was, I remember walking into Ron's office, and he says, Len, did you see this new thing from, you know, these guys, Diffie and Helen at Stanford? It's all about this. You send this, and you scramble that, and then at the other end. Of and I said, and, and to my ears, you know, I'm trying to, you know, uh, save the dignity of science because Gauss told me to do it, right? And this isn't going to save the dignity of science, right? And so I hear this as, you know, some kind of engineering thing about networks and stuff like that. And I remember interrupting him, basically saying, well, that's nice, Ron, but, you know, let's talk about blah, blah, blah. Uh, so it meant nothing to me. And so Ron... Uh, did enlist Adi, who was interested in it, Adi Shamir. And uh, together, they start working on this. But I'm always around these guys, right? And they become obsessed. Right? And they're constantly talking about it. And um, they're constantly coming up with possible public key crypto systems. See, Diffie and Hellman had said, this is how you could do it, but they couldn't make an actual incarnation. And, but they spelled out what you needed to make an incarnation. And Rivest and Shamir are trying to make an incarnation. And uh, they have numerous theories. And, you know, some of them come from uh, graph theory and a variety of places. All sorts of things. Combinatorics. They're going to create this public key crypto system. And... Uh, it's not, it turns out it's not such an easy thing to get it all to fit together right. And so they make these systems and they break them themselves, right? And I just have to endure, you know, they're talking about this stuff, okay? Uh, but for reasons we only understand now and we didn't understand then, all these systems are failing and they start to move towards number theoretic stuff, okay? Number theoretic uh, algorithms in particular. And of course, you know, nobody cares about algorithmic number theory, as you and I both know, you know, at that time. Uh, you know, but there's like, you know, what, six guys in the world who care, you know, and I happen to be one of them, right? So I know this, right? I mean, you know, as well as anybody knows it, right? So when they start to move into number theoretic kind of 
approaches to getting a public key crypto system. They're producing them every day. And I go in and I look at them and say, no, I can break that, right? You know, this, 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 boom, done. And mostly it goes that way. And it goes that way for months. And, uh, and occasionally they produce a really pretty clever system. And occasionally, uh, in one instance, they produced one so clever that I couldn't see how to break it. And I had to go home and really do some research to figure out how to break it. But it was breakable. Okay. And then uh, there's the night of Passover. I think it's 77, 1977. And one of our students, Ani Bruce, has a Seder or a you know, party and things for Passover. And she invites us all. And uh, uh, Ron and Adi and I and lots of other people are there. And at Passover, very often, there's Manischewitz wine. Okay. And uh, I didn't drink because I, I couldn't drink. But, uh, but Ron had no problem with it. And so I th he drank a lot, I think, of Manischewitz wine. Okay. So the party breaks up around 11, say, and we all depart. You know, it was a nice evening. And uh, I go back to my house, run to his house, and I receive a call at like midnight or maybe 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock. And it's Ron, okay, and Ron says, hey, Len, what about blah, blah, blah? And the blah, 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 he said, is what we now know as the RSA crypto system. And upon hearing it, I said, congratulations, Ron. I think you finally did it, you know, because it looks solid to me. You know, this one, wow. I wouldn't know where to begin to break this, right? Well, I know where to begin, but I couldn't succeed. Uh, anyway, right? And I, so I said, congratulations, Ron. And so hang up. Ron, I think, does not remember this call. Okay. But at any rate, and I go into MIT, I think it's the very next day. And Ron has apparently stayed up all night and handwritten a paper. Uh, okay. And I go, you know, I run into Ron, he says, he hands me the paper. And I look at it briefly and I say, oh, it's, you know, what you called me about last night, you know, this public key crypto system thing. And the, the authors on that paper are the default order, mm -hmm. Adelman Ravesh Shamir. And in, you know, one of those quirks of fate, uh, you know, and this stuff happens in life, um, I say to him, take my name off that paper. And he says, why? I said, you know, you thought of the idea. And he, he says, no, no, we worked as a, you know, as a team. This is a team, you know, I'm not taking, you know, you deserve to be on this paper. So we proceed to have an argument about my getting off the paper and him, he's arguing to keep me on it. And so we agree that we'll just think about it for a while. And I go home. And I think, my first question was sort of moral, ethical. Do I deserve to be on this paper? You know, am I going to be comfortable with myself if I'm on this paper? And uh, I reflect on that evening or two that I spent trying to break one of those crypto systems that they came up with. And I said, well, that was real research. The rest was just casual observation. But that was real research. By the way, that that system was discovered later by other researchers, published, but, you know, it was born dead because it's already broken. Uh, and so I said, yeah, I guess I, you know, I'm comfortable that I did contribute something. And so, uh, and I also said to myself, well, no one's ever going to read this paper, you know, but it'll be another line on my resume when tenure time comes. So, okay. And I go back into Ron and I say, I'll tell you what. Let's compromise. I'll become last author, and you'll be first. And that's how it became RSA rather than ARS. And uh, so that's the story of how RSA got born. Um, it still meant nothing to me, but it was soon to mean mm -hmm. a lot to me. In view of Adi's reluctance to grant interviews, oh, and he is, is reluctant. reluctant. He doesn't 
doesn't grant interviews. Oh, I didn't know that. So can you tell us what he was like to work with? Yeah. And, and how I, closely the three of you collaborated? Yeah, we collaborated really closely. Um, you know, I mean, we'd, we'd be doing research in gondolas at ski places in Vermont, you know, because we were always together, right? And, um, uh, but our collaboration, you know, mostly was around this public key stuff because, first of all, they were intensely interested in it. And second of all, then it became a big thing. And so we thought about a lot of, you know, subsequent problems that arose in that area uh, together. Um, working with them was absolutely great. And, uh, you know, working with, you know, special people like that is, is a joy. I mean, Adi is like... He's just like a lion. You know, you put an, a problem in front of him, he, he'll devour, right? He's just really, really, really smart. And Ron is one of these guys who, um, you know, if Ron decides that he's going to become a, uh, you know, rocket designer tomorrow, in five years he's going to be one of the best rocket designers in the world. You know, he can just do anything. So... Yeah, it was wonderful because, you know, we were, first of all, friends. And, uh, you know, what, what greater joy than to sit around with your friends and try to, you know, solve problems. It was wonderful. Of course, the agency that considered itself the guardian of secrecy yeah. during this time was the National Security Agency. Right. You must have run afoul of them. We did run afoul of them. And uh, so... I was still in a mode where I didn't understand that there had been this whole history of cryptography. I didn't understand, you know, what I understood is it still ain't going to, you know, take care of the dignity of science, right? So I, and then one day I'm in a bookstore in Berkeley, mm -hmm. okay? Oh, and, and Martin Gardner arises again. So Ron and Martin somehow got together, and it was a wonderful topic for a Martin Gardner article, and he wrote it. And, uh, and, uh, and, he, and he said that anybody who was interested in getting a copy of the manuscript could send a self-addressed envelope mm -hmm. to us. And I'm in a bookstore one day, and, uh, and I'm about to buy my book, and the guy in front of me has Scientific American, Okay. And he gets up to the cashier in front of me and he says, did you see this neat article on cryptography? And the cashier says, yeah, is that cool or what? And so, you know, sort of in a burst of immodesty, I said, oh, wow, that's stuff, you know, that I and my friends did. And, and so the guy who's buying the Martin Gardner, uh, I mean, the, turns to the Martin Gardner page where the article is and he says, would you sign this for me? Right now, you know, I'm sure everybody listening to this thinks that mathematicians are constantly accosted by, <laughs> you know, autograph seekers <laughs> and the like. Right? I know you, you know you're accustomed to this. You know, I certainly was, and no, it had never happened in my life, and I never even conceived that it ever would happen in my life. Who my autograph? And when that happened, I said, "What's going on here?" You know. Maybe there's a bigger context to this thing. And then I get back to MIT, and the room is filled with self-addressed stomped envelopes, okay? And I look at some of them, and they come from bizarre places, like the Bulgarian secret police or something <laughs> like that, right? And I'm going, what's going on here, right? Because I, I still don't know. And, 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 but I'm beginning to wake up. And then we hear from a representative of the, or an employee of the NSA that we can't send out these manuscripts in their self-addressed envelopes because it's against the law. And I go, law? What mm -hmm. law? You know, I mean, what is this? And so th it turns out that it was against the law uh, for us to send out information, say, about atomic bombs or stuff like that. And among the things that was against the law is crypto, crypto, cryptographic stuff. So it was against the law. And uh, so it was at that moment that I found out there was this agency called the NSA. And uh, 
No one knew about this agency. At that time, not even people in government knew about it. Only a small number of legislators and presumably executives uh, knew about it. And it was, when they talked about it, they jokingly, I heard, said, you know, they call it no such agency. But NSA did exist, and it was charged with protecting uh, our information from our enemies and breaking the codes of our enemies. And uh, yeah, and that became a whole chapter that continues to this day with Snowden and everything else. It's quite exciting. So what happened with all of these uh, requests for uh, yeah. your so, manuscript? Yeah, so, so ultimately the powers that be at, at MIT decided to send out the manuscripts. Okay. And uh, the whole thing precipitated a sort of big debate that involved, you know, the president's press secretary and the like and all sorts of people. And it broke into two camps, the academic freedom, privacy, security camp, and the national security camp. Sound familiar? You know, I mean, it's going on today still, this very break. And, uh, and so, uh, and it was very interesting. Now, at that time, and it's not my view today, you know, I naturally fell into the academic freedom, privacy, security camp. But, uh, you know, so I was passionate about that. But I, you know, I have a different view of the world now. And I, uh, I now think I totally understand the NSA's point of view. And uh, I think they ad acted very admirably in the way they handled it. And, you know, it's now become what it probably should become. I, you know, it, it's a line that is drawn by the political process. And it can be shifted a little this way and a little that way from time to time. You know, when there's more national security needs, less privacy and, and uh, you know, and when there's less national security needs, more privacy. And that's going to shift, I expect, ad infinitum, right? But it's, I think, the way it should be. So uh, I no longer passionately believe in my side and not the other. I think they're both it's just a line we have to live with. Okay, um, but it, there was one episode which was particularly interesting, and that's that uh, I used to write grants to the National Science Foundation, the, the leading supporter of pure science in this mm -hmm. country. That's where money for pure science comes from, and mathematics. And, uh, and I used to write grants, and it was sort of a ritual kabuki dance that we would go through every three years, right? And the dance would consist of, I'd write down all of the wonderful things I was going to do in algorithmic number theory, and they were going to be so wonderful that the country would thank me and thank NSF, okay? And that they could acquire this wonderful thing, you know, just by supporting my research, right? And so I'd write, you know, 20 pages or something on what I was going to do, and then I'd get a call from the NSF, you know, oh, well, we want to cut your budget on this and, you know, you know, blah, blah, blah. I say, okay, done, right? And that's, that had happened. I mean, that just was routine. And then in 1980 or thereabouts, I begin this process again. And because crypto has taken off, I'm not foolish. I'm not going to fail to mention that this is going to have big, important implications for crypto and privacy and national security, you know, whatever. So go through the ritual dance, and I get my call from NSF, and they say, love your stuff, Len. You know, we're going to fund it. Oh, by the way, NSF, uh, the National Security Agency is going to fund that part involving cryptography. Okay. And we had been at loggerheads for several years, the academic uh, freedom, privacy uh, part versus the national security part, right? And uh, they had tried all sorts of things to put the public key cryptography genie back in the bottle, legislative mm -hmm. action, uh, new crypto standards, which we presume they could break. Um, 
And so this war had been going on. But when I heard that particular line that the NSF, the NSA was going to uh, um, fund that part of my research that involved cryptography, I knew I'd won a battle. Okay, so I hung up the phone and I called Gina Collada again at the New York Times. And I said, you know, here's a story you might be interested in, right? The NSF, you know, the leading sponsor of pure research in our country, and the NSA, you know, that secret agency that, you know, does intelligence work, very important and, you know, keeps our country safe. You know, they seem to be collaborating now, right? And she did find that story interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, she did. And, yes, she did. And so I hang up with Gina, and then my phone rings again. And it's Bobby Inman, the head of the NSA. And he, he wants to explain that, you know, there's been a little misunderstanding. <laughs> okay. And I said, you know, you know, thanks for the call, but I, I think this is probably something that's going to be worked out, you know, in the open as part of the political process. And, uh, you know, thank you. <laughs> Bye. And, uh, and uh, so the, the article appeared, you know, in the New York Times. And uh, that, that event, I think, sort of helped draw the lines between mathematics and science and the NSA. And, you know, those lines are not drawn clear. You know, I mean, there's slides, but we've reached a point in time now where I'm very satisfied with where we are. NSA is important and protects this country and is vital to our interests. And, uh, you know, security and privacy on the internet and elsewhere are also important. And now, the political process decides where we need to draw those lines. And, uh, you know, I can't think of a better way things should be. What is the special property that RSA has that has made it so useful? Uh, one of the things it has is that it, it was first, you know, so it got adopted. Uh, the other thing it has is <clears throat> it's the cleanest of all the systems, I, I think. Uh, it, I always like purity, and I like to know what foundation I'm basing actions or theorems on. And even though it's not perfect, with RSA, it basically comes down to primality testing, which we know how to do fast, and factoring, which we don't know how to do fast. And it's pretty clear. You and I know that there's additional subtleties here, but, but uh, it's pretty clear. So I can see the foundation clearly. I know what gamble we're making, basically that factoring's not going to be done in polynomial time. Quantum computing <laughs> aside, okay? And uh, uh, other systems, I think, uh, have not been given the scrutiny historically on the, on the underlying foundation that RSA has. I mean, Gauss tried to find a polynomial time factoring algorithm. And if Gauss couldn't find one, us mortals can't, right? So that's what I like about it. It's purity. It's clear to me what's going on. The words squeamish ossifrage have a connection to RSA. Why? Yeah, they do. Oh, this is a good story. Ron won't like this either. <laughs> okay. So remember that Martin Gardner article, mm -hmm. and remember how Martin always used to like to give open problems. So he wanted to give an encrypted version of some message where if the readers could find out what the message was, uh, that would be the problem they were trying to solve. And so Ron did that, and uh, the message itself that he encrypted was squeamish ossifrage. Okay. Now, an interesting thing happened because uh, Ron kind of messed it up. Okay. So he did the calculation 
you know, of where, how big the key needed to be to make sure that with, you know, the rate at which computers were being done and Moore's Law and you do all the calculation, he wanted it to last for a billion years, I think, right? Okay, and he did all that calculation, but there was, but he did it based on a, a square root of n factoring algorithm. Mm. And we knew better than that because we had inquired, you know, among all the factoring guys, including, uh, uh, what was the guy's name who started with SCH? Um, he was a factoring guy. Uh, oh, Chappell. No, not yeah, Not Chappell? No. Oh, I thought it was Chappell. Wait, Chappell. Yes. Yeah, maybe it was, what's Chappell's first name? I Rich. Think. Richard. Rich. Yeah, it was Richard Chappell. So we had written to Richard because he was, you know, that was his specialty. What's the fastest, fastest algorithm? And he had written back, you know, you can't prove any of this stuff, but it's, you know, e to the, to the square root of n ballpark. You know, what we know it to be. But Ron didn't use that. And if he had used that, he would have used a bigger key, and it would have taken, you know, ballpark a billion years to break. But he used the wrong speed. Okay, and therefore, it got broken like 10 years later, right? right. Mm, How long did it take, Lenstrom? 1994. 94, it got broken, so. So, 77 to 94. Yeah, but that ain't a billion years. <laughs> no. <laughs> Another interesting thing about Chappelle and that letter, which I have a copy of, uh, Chappelle had read our manuscript, right? We sent it to him. And, uh, and Shrapil had, you know, made some comments about how we might improve it. And he said, you know, you're calling the one, uh, the person sending the information A, and you're calling the mm -hmm. receiver B. But, you know, they're really not mathematical symbols. You know, they're not representing mathematical quantities. Maybe you should give them actual names, A and B, right? And he said, call them Adolf and Boris. <laughs> and, and Ron vetoed that, but called them Alice and Bob, right? And that's why Alice and Bob are all over the place mm -hmm. in cryptography. And you know what? It's even contaminated uh, physics, because quantum mechanics guys, I think, now use Alice and Bob. Okay? So, uh, yeah. But it should be Adolf and Boris, Duder Schrappel. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Of course, it was already mentioned that RSA is broken once a quantum computer with enough qubits is constructed. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of this possibility? Well, I, I ask all the young quantum guys this question I've been asking ever since, um, you know, Shor's mm -hmm. breakthrough paper in that regard. And uh, you know what? They instead of becoming more and more pessimistic about actually building a quantum computer, mm -hmm. they have through time become more and more optimistic. And I, everybody I talk to today says, yeah, it's going to happen, right? Uh, we're going to get actual quantum computers. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some hedging about when it'll happen, mm -hmm. and there's some hedging about whether we'll ever be able to build one big enough to actually factor a big number because there's all sorts of error correction and mm -hmm. you need a lot of quantum bits. And, uh, but yes, it, you know, base, it's just hearsay to me, but I think it is something, you know, all you kiddies out there in the future, you know, are going to have your quantum computers on your desks. Okay. What was your involvement in the setting up of RSA Data Security Incorporated? Yeah. So uh, when RSA first came out, everybody said, wow, you guys are going to be rich. And I said, okay. You know, I wasn't <laughs> sure how, but, you know, it was clear the world was responding, right? So, uh, but we couldn't quite figure out how to get rich, right? So we, um, 
we talked to some companies about commercializing RSA, but we didn't know how to go about it, right? We weren't businessmen and we didn't have those skills. And um, so one day in my uh, studio apartment in LA, I'd moved to LA since then, Ron, Adi, and I got together and it was sort of like uh, Mickey Rooney, uh, you know, let's put on a show. We, we said, let's put on a company. And we signed papers. We had done a little footwork before, and it created the RSA Megacore, right? And we did it. And we had to choose roles to play because the Delaware documents required you filled in various. So Ron became, CEO, uh, became the chairman of the board. I became CEO. And Adi became, I guess, secretary or something. I don't know, you know, something. But, you know, it didn't matter. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so that's when RSA was born. And as CEO, I steered that ship, right, right into the gutter, <laughs> right? So we had raised a little bit of money, okay, from uh, a dentist to get us underway, and we'd written code and stuff. And... Uh, I was too naive. I didn't realize what business was all about. And make no mistake, you know, you mathematicians out there, business is hard, mm -hmm. real hard. And business requires very special skills and has its very special challenges. And I was not good at those things. And uh, so I'd steered it about into the drink, okay? and. Uh, and then uh, I resigned as CEO because there was this new CEO, but he didn't turn out to be very successful. And so then it continued to go into the drink. And by now it's been alive, RSA, for a couple of years. Um, and then Ron, like I said, you know, you set Ron to doing anything. If he decides to do it, he's going to do it super well. Uh, he decides to take his role as chairman of the board seriously. And he takes over the company and he fires everybody but a guy named Jim Bitsos. Mm. And Jim has all those skills which I lacked to be a real CEO. You know, lurch forward. You know, no matter what's going on, you just keep moving forward. And also he, he, he had the gift of gab. He could paint pictures for people. And, and he, the work he did in, you know, in building RSA into what it became, the company, uh, is just astonishing. And uh, you know, I, I sometimes say to him that we made uh, you know, similar contributions to RSA as CEO, you know, Jim and I, except you know, his had the right derivative, you know, <laughs> <laughs> right? And, uh, yeah, so he took RSA from this company. He had to educate the whole country into using it. He had to f defend the, uh, these ideas against the NSA, you know, the whole clipper chip episode. He was amazing. And, uh, and the first thing he did was he, uh, or I don't know if it was first, but when he became CEO, he, he raised more money, okay? And he called me and he said, oh, well, he was going to raise more money. And he said, look, you know, the company owes you a lot of money because we never got paid for anything. You know, we were the company. He says, uh, I'd like to give you 10 cents on the dollar of what we owe you. And I said, Jim, why, you know, why would I do that? He says, well, here may be a reason. You're on the board of that company. And if this company goes down, the investors in it mm -hmm. might sue you. And the last thing I wanted was to be sued and tied up in courts with lawyers and judges. And, you know. So I said, 10 cents sounds good. Okay. And then I resigned from the board because I didn't want to get sued. Right? And I had nothing to do with the company for many years while mm -hmm. Jim built it into this incredible thing. Are you happy with what happened to the RSA subsequent to your involvement? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, on the business front, 
uh, Jim had built this up. And, and every year, RSA would have this conference, right? A crypto conference they'd put on. And I'd gone to a few of the early ones. Um, and, uh, you know, there were all the usual guys, you know, uh, the guy from Sandia and, you know, mm -hmm. you know them. Uh, and, you know, it, it'd be the usual guys, you know, a bunch of us wearing, you know, slippers and, you know, us guys, right? And there'd be 30 of us. And so years went on, years went on. I didn't want to hear about RSA. Business was too hard for me. Um, and then there was some anniversary at RSA, and they said, Len, will you come up for the RSA conference because it's kind of a big deal? I said, okay, I'll go up. So I flew up to San Francisco, and I went into the Fairmont Hotel. And uh, I said, where's the RSA conference room? And they said, well, it's ballroom blah, blah, blah. And I go down there, and, I ex and I'm about to walk in, and I expect it to be guys like you and me, mm -hmm. you, you know, and the usual guys in their slippers and beards, right? <laughs> and I open the frickin' door, and Jim is on the stage like, you know, a quarter of a mile away from me. And, and there's this big screen behind him showing Jim, and everywhere I look, there's thousands of people wearing suits and everything. Mm -hmm. And I say to myself, I'm rich. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> you know? Uh, <laughs> I was, you know, thunderstruck. And, uh, yeah, so it was really quite amazing. So Jim has taken that, you know, took that company to be a huge thing. It spun off VeriSign and all this. And it's a centerpiece of, you know, privacy and security on the Internet, right? Mm -hmm. I mean whatever there is of that stuff. Um, and uh, so that's been a wonderful development. Another wonderful development is what it did to number theory, algorithmic number theory, and more generally to the area of cryptography which it helped create, right? So because it hooked number theory to something that people actually wanted and was commercial, uh, it got funded and the like, and it became this thriving thing, right? There's a lot of algorithmic number theorists in the world, I think, today, right? Mm -hmm. Many more than when you and I began. And, uh, and, uh, and the cryptography has become a major sub-area of computer science itself. Mm -hmm. You know, the sun never sets on a crypto conference. If you look at the schedule yes. of crypto conferences, there's one all the time somewhere in the mm -hmm. world, right? It's just amazing. So to see that grow out, you know, it's been wonderful to watch. Um, and of course, it, you know, it, it's been, you know, very nice for me in a variety of ways, you know. So, yeah, it's been wonderful. And it's just been a, a great story to watch. You know, I sometimes occasionally still go to the RSA conference. And I go there and I sit in the office. And, you know, the last one I went to was like two years ago. And there's somewhere between 30 and 50,000 people there. You know, it takes place in the Moscone Center, mm. you know, and in San Francisco. And, and I sit there and I just, you know, wonder at how these little things you do can sometimes, you know, snowball. So it's really fun for me to observe it. And, but the best part is I get together with, we always have a dinner at the RSA conference, and I get together with Jim Bitsos, Ravest and Shamir, and Hellman and Diffie. Mm -hmm. You know, and for us, it's just sitting around talking about our children and, yes. you know, and just going, look what happened, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's a joy. A remarkable thing to happen for a paper on which you wanted your name at the end. Yeah, and you're right, which I thought no one would ever read. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the citation uh, uh, for the award is careful not to say that you discovered it. Hmm. What do you make of that? I don't know. It's, it, it, the award talks about practical. Yes, right? yes it does. And, and for me, you know, I didn't write the award. I'm very grateful to receive it, you know. But, but you know, 
it was never a practical endeavor for me. Well, it was briefly when I was CEO, but, you know. Geez, Were they I taking into it. account the fact that it had been discovered years earlier at the GCHQ? Oh, maybe so. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, so, so it, okay. At GCHQ in, in England, uh, which is their NSA, uh, there were uh, Clifford Cox, uh, a few other, maybe you remember the names. Ellis? Ellis, yes. And these guys, we hear, and I have no doubts it's true, because um, everything's classified, so you never quite know. But, um, uh, yeah, they apparently had discovered the notion of public key cryptography and had come up with RSA, uh, I think in like 75, 76? Mm, both that, maybe 74. Okay, maybe 74. But a difference of about three or four years. Yeah, anything. so, um, yeah, and, and uh, so those guys uh, probably did it as well. And, and I admire them uh, mostly for, you know, their service to their country because, you know, they didn't receive the accolades that we got, you know, it was a sacrifice for them to serve their country. And I think that's extremely admirable. Much of what we are discussing was written up for popular consumption by Stephen Levy in his book, Crypto. Yeah. What do you think about the book? Oh, I don't remember it well enough. Uh, I th as I recall, I, I liked the book. And I certainly like what Stephen Levy writes, uh, but I, I'm sorry, I don't recall it well enough to comment okay. on it. All right. Yeah. The Turing Prize is the equivalent in computing to the Nobel Prize and other areas of human achievement. How did you and your family react to the announcement that you had won this very prestigious award? Well, um, how did my family, I think they were very proud of me. You know, my children were very proud of me. My by then ex-wife was probably pretty proud of me, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I know my, my children, you know, love me and want the best for me and, you know, have joy when I succeed. So that was very good. For me, it was, it had many effects. And if you ask me this question, you know, every day I'll give you different mm -hmm. answers. But Here's, here's one thing it did that, that was important to me. Uh, and it was a process that began much earlier. Uh, when I got an offer for a job at MIT, you know, to be a professor of mathematics, I told my father, you know, and he said, oh, that's wonderful, Len, and, you know, tell me all about it. And I told my dad. And he said, um, you know, before you accept the offer, the offer, Len, uh, you know, check with Bank of America again because they have a great retirement fund plan, you know? And I thanked my dad, and, but I accepted the MIT offer anyway. But for my dad, he'd been shaped like we all are by our earlier experiences, and he was a depression era guy. And, you know, MIT wasn't going to pay me anything. They considered it a privilege to be there, and they were right, okay? But, you know, no retirement plan for me. So anyway, uh, but for me, it's interesting. It had a very different effect. So when I got this position at MIT, um, as a young boy, you know, once I got on the mathematics train, uh, you know, this is my goal, this is what I aspire to, you know, to be a mathematics professor at a great university. I mean, that was, you know, reaching for the stars. That was the gold medal for me. And uh, so I remember walking across campus and saying to myself, you know what? Now I can be a shoemaker. Because I had validated inside myself that I could achieve the things I wanted to achieve. I could achieve what I considered great things. And therefore, I had the freedom, the right, to do whatever it was I wanted to do, okay? And we don't get immortality. You know, you, we, I can't figure out how to achieve that. But if you get lucky enough in life to be able to do the things you want to do, 
wow, that's, that's great fortune, right? And the, the Turing Award augmented that. So when I got the Turing Award, it was not only that I could do the things I wanted to do, but uh, it, it made it so that um, people would listen to me and they would provide me resources and they provide me, in some cases, the most valuable resources, their intellects, to help me do the things I wanted to do, right? And so, you know, it, it, it just, it gave me a bigger megaphone to go viral, right, with my ideas. Good or bad, people would listen, right? And, uh, and so, uh, you know, I got, I did the things I wanted to do, I would have done them anyway, but I got nurtured in doing them because of the Turing Award. Uh, so it ha had that impact. Um, and so, y you know, it's just part of this blessing that I'm one of those people who got to do what I wanted to do. Wow, you know, what more could you hope for? So uh, it was that. And the Turing Award also, what else does it do? I don't know. For me, internally, that's what it did. It, it gave me this open field, and I'm thankful for it all the time. Now I want to turn to your uh, achievement sub subsequent to RSA. Yeah. Um, in particular, I would like to talk to you about your role in the development of the uh, Edelman, Pomerantz, and Rumley primality testing yeah. algorithm. Mm -hmm. It's a very significant contribution to the area. Uh, before APR, there was no consistent method of mm -hmm. attack and proving a number prime. Right. Instead, there were a collection of ad hoc methods mm -hmm. uh, that were not always ap applicable in any given case. You yeah. produced a truly novel idea. How fast is this technique, and what else would you like to say about it? Yes, not fast enough <laughs> is the short answer. So remember, Gauss had told me to work on this problem, and I dutifully worked on this problem. I mean, I worked on it for years, a lot, a lot of time. And uh, in a sort of aha moment that, you know, occasionally we're lucky enough to experience, mm -hmm. I saw something, you know, that maybe had never been seen before. And uh, I had hoped that this was the breakthrough that would lead to the polynomial time algorithm and therefore save the dignity of science, right? And... Uh, uh, and, but I wasn't a good enough number theorist, especially analytic number theory and some of the, uh, you know, algebraic number theory that I didn't know at the time, uh, to carry it out. But Pomerantz and Rumley were good in those areas. So we collaborated and pieced together this algorithm, which I really like just because I like this algorithm. I mean, I think there's a lot of good ideas in it. Uh, and it turns out that it, it runs almost polynomial time. It is like so close, but it's not polynomial time. And uh, so, uh, very pleased with that achievement. You know, I like it very much. But the AKS algorithm has come along subsequently, and they did indeed, uh, you know, satisfy the dignity of science, and they produced a deterministic polynomial time algorithm for primality testing. Where was the APR pub paper published? It was published in Annals of Mathematics. I why think. is that significant? I think, I'm not sure why it's significant, but I think it was the first time they ever published mm -hmm. anything that was algorithmic in nature. And since it is, you know, one of the premier mathematical journals in the world, it sort of was a landmark uh, in that. You know. finally got respect from the mathematicians. Oh, you think so? Maybe so. Maybe so. <laughs> the, the, there was other work on primality that I did with uh, Ming Dae Huang. Mm -hmm. I'll that get I think to that. I'll oh, get okay. To that. Was the method practical? Uh, was the method the word, practical? Uh, the word practical in quotes. Yeah. Uh, no, as I recall, it wasn't. In fact, uh, yeah, I. No, I don't think anybody's ever done it, you know, implemented it. <laughs> but that wasn't my concern, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just beautiful in the sense that we mathematicians 
you know, have acquired this aesthetic over thousands of years that no one but us understands, that lit up my beauty light. And what happened in the study of primality testing after APR appeared? Yeah, what happened was uh, there were many people uh, who, who worked on it, more and more as I think the crypto thing invited people into the mm -hmm. field. And uh, uh, you could go back to Gary Miller's stuff, mm -hmm. which I mentioned earlier. And out of Gary Miller's stuff, he was aware of this, by the way, but didn't bother to write it down. You could get what was called a random polynomial time algorithm for, uh, well, primality. And uh, later that was made explicit by uh, Rabin and I think Solovey. No, Solovey and Strassen, Solovey and, Strassen and then Rabin yes. uh, added some things to that. And, uh, uh, but that was really, really, really interesting because it brought randomness into the study mm -hmm. of computation. Uh, and randomness plays this mysterious and wonderful role in computation. As long as you can provide a real source of randomness, whatever exactly that is, you can do some, solve some problems on a computer faster than if you don't have a source of randomness. Mm -hmm. Now, randomness is usually thought of as total garbage. I mean, that's right. It has no information in it. But you can't trick these machines and give it really good stuff in place of the randomness, like nice organized sequence, like 0, 1, 0, 1. You've got to give it real randomness, then it runs fast and does the right thing. You give it phony randomness, mm -hmm. it'll fail. So it's, you know, it used to be garbage in, garbage out. Now it's garbage in, good stuff out, good stuff in, bad stuff out with these algorithms. It's paradoxical, it's fascinating, <laughs> and I don't think we've gotten to the bottom of it mm -hmm. yet. And they brought that into the study of many things, including primality. And uh, uh, so then uh, Goldwasser and Killian, uh, and Killian? Killian yeah, uh, saw that they could use uh, elliptic curves to give a really cool algorithm mm -hmm. that, uh, uh, but they couldn't prove that it actually was a random polynomial time algorithm for compositeness. The slight difference between a random polynomial time algorithm for primality and one for compositeness. They couldn't prove that it was, uh, but that uh, stimulated Ming Dae Huang and myself to try to find a variant of their algorithm which we could prove was random polynomial time. And th that was sort of a, uh, <clears throat> And we did, mm -hmm. and uh, that was that, another good step. That in. was a very deep paper. Um, yeah, and it, it also was not practical. No, practical you know, has been lower on my mm -hmm. yeah, radar okay. screen, and 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 so you know, but it was a very deep paper because it forced Ming and I to get into some deep algebraic geometry and to start to exploit that. Now, simultaneously, one of the great algorithmic number theorists, you know, probably of all time, was Hendrik Lenstra. Mm -hmm. And Hendrik had also gotten into algebraic geometry, and in fact, it was his ideas with René Schoff, uh ideas that uh, sort of gave rise to the Goldwasser-Killian paper, and then in, the, mm -hmm. in so, we ended up using um, some pretty deep stuff in this paper that Ming and I had done. And we were invited to give a, uh, a, um, a plenary lecture at the International yes. Conference of Mathematics. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and in the audience were the great you know, algebraic geometric number theorists. Deline was there, Sarah was there, Maybe Andrew Wiles was there, but I don't didn't know of him until later. You know, where we all know about him. Uh, and and perhaps that talk additionally added to, you know, the acceptance of theoretical computer science as a mathematical mm -hmm. discipline worth considering. Okay. Well, you mentioned Lenstra. I guess he, in a sense, with Henri Cohen, did make. APR practical. 
did they? Well, they produced this uh, wonderful uh, stuff on uh, the use of this. Well, they were using uh, various kinds of Jacobi sums, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and when they used that, they, it, it actually it worked pretty well. Oh, uh, okay. I probably knew this, but, you know, I'll appeal to uh, okay. you know, oh. age. Is, <laughs> yeah. We can do that at our age, yes. Yes. <laughs> You've talked about your work in primality testing. Yeah. Did you ever make any contribution to the integer factoring problem? I made a contribution. Uh, there was this... Um, this result, who do we attribute it to, uh, th this L L1 third? Oh, result? Pollard. Pollard, John yes. Pollard. So Pollard comes out of nowhere with this new technique for factoring. Mm -hmm. Caught me totally by surprise. And, uh, and uh, I remember hearing Hendrik Lenstra give a talk on Pollard's method. And I, even after hearing the talk, I asked Hendrik, I said, I don't get it. Where's the magic? You know, how does this work? You know, why does it work better than anything we had ever tried in the past? And he explained that. So he, Hendrik Lenstra and Pollard and I think Arian Lenstra might have also been involved in this, uh, maybe others, uh, started to pursue Pollard's method and try to make it formal and prove that it had the properties we had good reason to suspect it did. And I started doing the same thing. And... Uh, uh, so, at some point, uh, I introduced, I don't know what they called singular numbers, something. Anyway, uh, and I think that that was a, a good way to look mm -hmm. at a certain part of what they were doing. So, I, I produced a paper on that, and I think that the Lenstras and Pollard and those that were working on it produced a book. Mm -hmm. Maybe yes, or, they did, and I, and I think they adopted that particular approach to that particular thing, and so, uh, yeah, I think that was sort of my contribution. Curiously, I was inhibited in working on factoring by uh, the existence of the RSA, hmm. and not because because I had agreed with my colleagues, and I took everything so seriously. I agreed with my colleagues that we shouldn't. Uh, what, what was it for some, you know, economic that we shouldn't try to uh, work again? I don't know. I don't know. I had some agreement that it was really a commercial sort of agreement because we had mm -hmm. formed a company that I shouldn't work on, mm -hmm. you know. And I took that seriously and I regretted it because it was the natural problem for me to work on. But I didn't do it. Well, let's talk about how hard do you think the problem is? I think it's hard. Um, you know, I explored a lot of tools and a lot of methods and thought very hard about them in my life as an algorithmic number theory theorist. And, you know, sort of have a feeling like I know what's out there. Of course, it's changing all the time. Mm. And while it was enough to prove a number prime or not prime, right? It just didn't look like the tools were there to make a great breakthrough, a polynomial time breakthrough, on factoring. I just never could find the crack in the door for that, you know, the little way to try to ease your way in. I never could. And I, uh, and I uh, you know, eventually just came to believe that if it was going to happen, if there's a polynomial time algorithm for it, deterministic polynomial time, uh, then it's it's 100 years away. You know, a lot more has to be done. And I suspect, you know, Gauss couldn't do it. Maybe it, he had a good reason not to be able to do it. Maybe it can't be done. What do you think of that? I'm not allowed to say. Oh, <laughs> come on. What would you... Do you have any comments on the status of the problem today? Yeah. Um, the status uh, of the problem itself has not changed theoretically much since the time of Pollard's idea. Mm -hmm. um, there's been implementations that are probably better or worse than others, and computers get faster and like that. But I don't think uh, much has changed in that regard. The, the 
big change that did happen was the advent of quantum computation, at least theoretically. And that, that um, was sort of foreshadowed by Feynman and yes. uh, uh, picked up by various guys like um, in England, uh, uh, gee, he, he does a lot of many world stuff. Pen? Uh, my bad. Huh? No. no. Um, anyway. It wasn't Penrose. No, 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 no. Okay, my bad. I, okay. I just I apologize. Uh, and it was picked up by Vazarani and others. Mm -hmm. And they started to develop this theory of quantum mechanics uh, as a means of computation. And then uh, that went along for a while. And then uh, Peter Shor uh, suddenly proved that on a quantum computer, you could factor in polynomial time. And that made the whole field extremely interesting. And, uh, and uh, so, if quantum computers come about, factoring may be doable in polynomial time in the real world, which is good enough because cryptography as a practical topic exists in the real world, RSA could go away, right? Factoring mm -hmm. could be settled. Um, so um, that's a threat on the horizon for those who use RSA, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's uh, turn the, to another area. You've worked on Fermat's last theorem. Yeah. Uh, what result did you produce? Okay, so Manuel Blum is my advisor. You know, Linda Kavner at Fed at, at said, go work with Manuel Blum. I said, okay, so I did that. Manuel was an incredibly great teacher and an incredibly brilliant and inventive guy. You know, working outside the box, you know, he, he was a master at that. He come out with ideas that had nothing to do with anything that had preceded, preceded them, sui generis. And, uh, and so I was working on number theory and various other things when I was a graduate student. And because I was, you know, such a purist, um, I remember going into Manuel's office one day and I said, you know, I think I'm going to work on Fermat's last theorem. And most advisors might, you know, give me a cautionary sort of, well, you know, maybe you should try <laughs> something, right, because Fermat's last theorem is, was open for 350 years and was the greatest most famous open problem in all of mathematics, subsequently settled by Andrew Wiles in a you know, great master work. And, uh, and so, uh, but Manuel said, oh yeah, that's a good idea. And so he gave me license to go, you know, work on Fermat's last theorem. And I think, you know, it's very good advice. I'd like to give it to young uh, researchers, um, don't sell yourself short. Um, you don't know how well you can do. Maybe you can do great things, but you'll never find out if you only work on small things, right? And, and uh, uh, so a certain amount of courage uh, is warranted. And if you try for really hard things, you usually fail. But you'll learn tremendous amounts in the process, and you'll be able to prove, use those tools to prove lots of very worthy results. But just don't, don't settle for less if you don't have to. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, yeah, so um, Manuel sort of taught me that lesson and, you know, I seized on it. So I started working on Fermat's last theorem and uh, at one point produced a really nice result together with uh, Heath Brown and Ivanitz. And uh, uh, we produced something about the so-called first case of Fermat's last theorem, infinitely many primes. And this was mm -hmm. sort of the first time, I guess you could argue that 
something had passed the finitely many cases, you know, boundary. So I was very pleased with that result, and we published that, and uh, uh, that was that was nice. Uh, of course, Andrew Wiles was to come along and, uh, you know, just blow the whole thing out of the water, and, uh, uh, you know, just brilliant stuff. So my paper with my colleagues is, or two papers actually, uh, is fairly meaningless at this time, but... Um, but that had a lot, Wiles' result had a lot to do with um, my sort of considering other things than number theory uh, mathematically because I realized I'd bet on the wrong horse. You know, I'd bet on algebraic number theory, a la Kumar, mm-hmm. Kumar and stuff. And, uh, you know, Wiles had made it clear that it was algebraic geometry. And... Uh, uh, and I looked at that and I said, you know what? I figure it'll take me six years of hard study before I can learn those tools adequately to use them, to wield them. And I said, no, I'm not willing to do it. And so, yeah. Mm. It's not well known, but you were the prime mover in the establishment in 1994 of the biannual Algorithmic Number Theory Symposium, better known as ANTS. Yeah. Uh, this meeting has become a major conference in al- algorithmic number theory and has been held all over the world. Yeah. Can you tell us something about how and why you got involved in this project? Yeah. So uh, it was sometime in the... W- what year was the first one? 1994. 94. No. Oh. Well, I had always avoided getting the Internet and this thing called the email... And because I wanted to sit in a room and think mm-hmm. about, you know, these problems. And, uh, but finally, I decided to get them. You know, people were complaining they couldn't reach me, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, well, maybe that's not so bad. But anyway, and so I got the Internet and I got email. And uh, I went overboard. So I start communicating with my colleagues, right? And we... All the, you know, it's really exciting. And, and, uh, and then I think, you know, maybe we should all get together and have a conference about, you know, our passion for algorithmic number theory. And uh, Ming-Tai Huang is my colleague at USC. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, so I enlist his aid. And uh, so things get out of hand. And this, this idea of a conference really starts rolling, Right. And so now I become engaged in something much like when I was running a company. It's not easy to put on conferences and, you know, find a location for them and get them funded and stuff. So, uh, but we did that, and there was a a guy uh, at um, at Cornell. Again, I can't pull up his name right away. And and he... um, he offered to host it there and did a lot of the work for the conference. And his wife was an artist. And I wanted it to, this conference to have a catchy sort of acronym, so I chose Algorithmic Number Theory, ANTS, Symposium or something, mm-hmm. ANTS. And his wife was a, an artist, mm-hmm. and I asked if she would uh, draw a nice ant that we could put on the you know, things associated with the conference. And so that's why there's little ants on the Springer Verlog thing, you know, and mm-hmm. announcements of it. So um, it was just exactly at the time when Peter Shore's uh, quantum mm-hmm. factoring algorithm came out. And Peter, I don't think, had given a talk on it. So I got a hold of Peter and I said, would you please come to this first ants conference and speak about this new factoring mm-hmm. algorithm? Because it will be intensely interesting to these this audience, and so um, we held the conference in Cornell. I think it was a great success, and Peter came and gave the first public talk, I think, on quantum and, uh, and, and factoring, and uh, that launched the discipline. Mm-hmm. And, and so, you know, people set it up as a, every two years we'd have this in various parts of the world, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, 
as I understand, it's thriving now, mm -hmm. and you know, it's it's the central thing that people in algorithmic number theory uh, want to mm -hmm. attend. Mm -hmm. So it's great. It's also the venue in which they award the Selfridge Prize. I don't know about the Selfridge. Yeah, the Selfridge I know Prize. Selfridge, but I don't know. There's yeah, a prize. They uh, they put a prize. Excellent. Uh, it's something about the Number Theory Foundation sort of decided to uh, uh, put a prize together for Excellent. computational number theorists. Great. Who's won it recently? Uh, I, I do not remember who won it recent, most recently. I wasn't okay. at the most recent meeting. They're given okay. away at the meeting. Okay. But, uh, Pleased yeah. to hear it. Oh, yes. Oh, oh, as I recall, you contracted a lengthy illness somewhat after uh, the first ants meeting. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us something about that? Is well, I, cause I, I think I, I saw you in a wheelchair at one point. Yeah. Uh, look, I, life's a struggle. It is for all of us. You know, there's difficult times and there's great times, but it's always a struggle. And I've been very blessed physically. You know, I mean, a lot of terrible things happen to people and they haven't happened to me. But, you know, I haven't escaped entirely from physical woes. And I've had a few that have, you know, damaged me. Uh, one is that I used to get something called cluster headaches, which oh, yes. was terrible, and I had for like 25 years, and they, they were awful. Uh, another thing that happened was a stupid thing. Uh, I was, I think, playing racquetball, and I hit the wall and I became black and blue all over the side of my body. And, uh, you know, when had had x-rays, nothing showed up. But soon thereafter, uh, my back failed, okay? I conjecture that I, you know, messed something up down there. And it got worse and worse and worse and limited my movement more and more and more and created more and more chronic pain. And I was reduced to being in a wheelchair for a while, and, uh, and I couldn't do anything, and it contributed to the destruction of my marriage, and it was just a very bad time for me. And, uh, uh, but, but there's a big lesson that, you know how as professors, sometimes troubled young people come up and maybe ask us about, you know, their personal problems. And one of the things I always tell them is, you know, in my experience, Whatever is horrible in your life right now, whatever you cannot see a way out of, what is going to you know just destroy your life, make you miserable. Um, in my experience, it's very likely that in five years, it won't even be on your radar. The good that's the good news. The bad news is something horrible will come along and replace it, right? But, but, you know, so keep the broader picture. So. The headaches went away for some reason I don't know, but they stopped. And and the the back problems I was having, you know, this thing that was confining me to a wheelchair, uh, I tried everything. You know, I tried orthopedic guys, shots, and this, that, and the other thing. I tried chiropractors, and I tried massage therapists, and you know, I tried physical therapy and yoga and a zillion things, and I learned that. You know, this old saying, when all you have is a hammer, the whole world looks like nails. Every one of those practitioners in all those fields sees you as their nail. And the odds that they're all right are vanishingly small. So you just got to go on, you know, down the list of things and try them, is my experience. And maybe if you're lucky, somewhere down that list, something will actually be useful to you. And it happened to me. I found a few things on the list, the most important of which was to start enduring a bit of pain and start building up my body through exercise. And it took me, you know, it's taken me 20 years. But, um, you know, right now, I can, I'm always in pain. You know, people our age are quite often always in pain. Uh, but I can do everything I want to do. You know, I can walk now, you know, I can go places I want. So it's been great. So, you know, life's a struggle. You overcome them. And I, I'm very blessed, you know. I 
A lot of people have a lot worse than I do. You're one of the few people I know who has a Hollywood credit. Ah, yes. You want to tell do. us about sneakers? Of course. So uh, the sneakers, yeah. So there were these guys, Lasker and Parks, and they had uh, uh, made a movie called War Games. It starred Matthew Broderick, I think. Mm -hmm. And it was a big success. Okay. And uh, so based on that success, they were now uh, able to produce Hollywood films. You know, they mm -hmm. could get money and stuff. And so they call me one day, I'm at USC now, and uh, they say, you know, we'd like to come over and discuss a movie idea with you. And I said, okay, you know, come over and we'll discuss it. And they came in and they said, well, we have this movie idea that we're pursuing. And the idea is it's, there's going to be this secret code and, you know, it gets broken and the world is threatened by it and everything like that. I said, okay. And he, and I, and he, they, Lasker, I think it was, said, ah, you know, uh, and then we have this other idea of a movie, you know, because we're considering a couple others. So I, the, uh, this other movie would be about these people who have been sort of frozen for a very long time, medically frozen. And there's this new drug, I think it was probably dopamine, that you can give to these people and they come out of it. You know, they can dance and everything else and they can have been frozen for years and, you know, sort of uh, Rip Van Winkle stuff. And I remember saying to them, wow, that sounds a lot more interesting than crypto. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and so, so, uh, so they disappear. <laughs> you know, thank you. Bye. I don't hear from them again. The next time I encounter them, this movie Awakenings comes out, which starred De Niro and uh, the comedian who recently died. Robin uh, Williams. Robin Williams. Really good movie. And uh, uh, that was, they made that movie, right? So after that, I get a call and they say, you know, can we come over again? And I say, sure. And they say, look, we're now making that crypto movie we talked about. And we would like it if you would help us and advise us on this movie. And in particular, there's going to be a scene where this cryptographer has a breakthrough in factoring. And he, you know, and it's going to have big implications for crypto, right? And so I said, uh, sure, you know, that sounds fun. You know, that sounds nice. Uh, I'll do that. And so they offered to pay me to you know, do this work of creating dialogue for the movie, the mathematical dialogue, and of creating slides and dialogue for the professor who's going to describe this breakthrough in factoring. Okay, so they say, you know, we'll pay you for that, and I say, no, you know, I don't want to get paid, but I'll do it if you give me Robert Redford, who stars in the movie. And so they. I say, I'll do it if I can introduce my wife to Robert Redford, you know? <laughs> and so they agree to that. So uh, I go home and I really work hard be on my little old-fashioned Apple. This is very early. Mm -hmm. Things aren't user-friendly, mm -hmm. you know? Graphics is not easy. And uh, I make these brilliant, dazzling slides, right? And I write dialogue, and I write dialogue wherein uh, I, uh, uh, the slides and everything are about uh, towers of number fields and, uh, and Arden maps. They're just mm -hmm. some fantasy. And, uh, and I decide that, and I have to write dialogue for the talk, right, uh, that this professor is going to give. So I write some, well, probably his monologue, uh, for the talk. And uh, I have the professor saying, uh, it is a breakthrough of Gaussian proportions, right? Because since Gauss had given me so much, I thought I could give him a plug <laughs> in a major movie, right? So I, I really like that, a Gaussian proportions. So, and then I, I was going to call the... Um, 
the name of the new method, the function field sieve, mm -hmm. because the current best factoring I was the number field sieve, mm -hmm. and I was working on a paper called the function field sieve. And I don't know why I decided against that. I, I wish I had called it the function field <laughs> sieve because it would have really helped the function field sieve paper I was writing. So anyway, uh, there came the day when it was time to actually shoot the scene and we went out to this college in LA and uh, uh, there was Robert Redford, okay, and, uh, and so uh, we got introduced and, you know, in particular my wife got introduced <laughs> and uh, then uh, we chatted for a while. At least I chatted with Redford for a while, and he was talking about Stephen Hawking, stuff mm -hmm. like that. So he's interested in that kind of stuff. My wife just stopped after hello. I think she was starstruck, you know, like Robert Redford. And uh, anyway, so we chatted for a while, and then they 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 filmed the scene, right? And uh, it's a pretty good scene. Uh, and uh, but, and, and I got. I think I was mathematical consultant, mm -hmm. you know, I'm in the credits, right, as mathematical consultant. But as I like to say, you know, the academy snubbed me because <laughs> apparently the mathematical consulting Oscar went to somebody else that year, you know. Yeah. You're associated with the creation of an early cr computer virus. Can you tell us something about that? Yeah, that's another interesting episode. So. I'm at USC, it's 1983, and I'm teaching a course on computer security and privacy, you know, because crypto, right? And this kid, Fred Cohen, comes up to me after class one day and he says, um, Professor Adelman, I have this idea for this new kind of security threat on the computer. I'm going to write this program and then everybody's going to use this program, but it's secretly going to send me all their privileges and access to all their data. And I said, yeah, that's, that would work, Fred. And Fred said, I want to try it. And I said, you don't have to try it, Fred, because it's clearly going to work. And he said, no, I want to try it. I want to try it. And so he wears me down, and I go to the um, chairman of the department, because we don't have personal computers at that time. We all use one big computer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I go to the chairman of the department, I said, look, this kid in my class wants to try this experiment, blah, blah, blah. And the chairman says, sure, why not? So Fred proceeds to write this malicious software. And he proceeds to make it available to everybody on the computer. And everybody, or enough people take it so that when they take this program up, it sends Fred access to all their data and all their privileges. And so Fred takes over the whole computer. Mm -hmm. He can see everything, do everything, change all the grades if he wants, mm -hmm. right? Okay. And he runs this several times, right? And he comes back to class, and I invite him to present his results to the class, and he describes what happened. And it takes over the computer. You know, the only interesting thing is it took 30 minutes this time, and this time it took five minutes, some different variation. And he, he gets all control of the computer. And, uh, and so uh, Fred uh, wants to do more experiments, right? Because now he's thinking hard about what you could do with these things, right? He wants to do more experiments, and he's thinking about it, what he could do. And he wants to use more computer time, right? But by that time, word gets out about what Fred has done. And other people are starting to think about what you could do with programs like this. And the chairman decides he'd been a little hasty <laughs> in letting Fred uh, do this, <laughs> right? And so no more experiments. But Fred wanted to do his PhD thesis on this kind of thing. And I wasn't his official advisor. Uh, Irving Reed of Reed Solomon Coates mm -hmm. fame uh, was his advisor. But in some ways, I was a de facto advisor. And so he starts writing a paper on a thesis on computer viruses, practical aspects, some theoretical aspects. And uh, then one day, 
I'm at a crypto conference, the Santa Barbara Crypto Conference, mm -hmm. and I run into a reporter I knew, Lee Dembart of the LA Times, and as a routine matter, he says, Len, you know, what's new? Anything interesting happening? I said, no, nothing's really going on. Uh, I got this student who's started work on this thing we call a computer virus, okay? And I, you know, I was naive. I, sh I should have known that, you know, you tell a reporter <laughs> that you're working on something called a computer virus. <laughs> well, yeah. So Lee writes the first, you know, public article, and uh, as I recall, it even had the now familiar computer with the thermometer, you know, image on it, mm -hmm. and uh, says, uh, you know, computer viruses, and uh, he describes it and uses the term computer viruses, and that's the first time it appears in, in, popul in, the, in the news press, and, uh, you know, I've subsequently learned that both the term computer virus has been used, was used in science fiction before me by a guy named Greg Bender. And that other programs, you know, in addition to Fred, that were happening around the same time, also had, could mm -hmm. be claimed to be the first computer mm -hmm. viruses. But, you know, for me at least, uh, you know, Fred's the father of the computer virus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you talked earlier about some of your uh, DNA work. Uh, would you like to expand a little bit more on that? Yeah, a little bit. Um, so what happened was uh, that sort of pushed me into getting an actual molecular biology lab. And I started doing experiments in molecular biology and uh, had people in the lab, uh, Eric Winfrey and Paul Rodeman, who I mentioned, you know, these guys were great at this kind of thing. There were also theoretical computer scientists. So, you know, this was computer science meets biology. and. Uh, but there were a lot of people in the lab, and it was a big lab, and people were throwing grant money at me. And, uh, uh, and I found myself back in this situation I never wanted to be in, of running an endeavor, which I wasn't good at. But uh, fortunately, Eric and Paul in particular, but others as well, were really good at this stuff. And they sort of flipped the whole field on its head. And this gets back to cellular automata, because we knew you could compute with the tools of biology. Uh, but there's a million ways to go about computing. Mm -hmm. One of the most fundamental things that, you know, the great logicians like Turing and Gödel taught us was it doesn't take much to compute everything that's computable to be universal. Just a way to store some data and a mm -hmm. way to manipulate it. And the ways can be incredibly simple but you get, still can compute everything that's computable. And so we knew there were a million ways to use these tools to compute. And one of the ways goes back to cellular automata. And Eric Winfrey started to say, well, we can take strands of DNA and they'll self-assemble into structures based on how they interact with each other. And we can do universal computation that way. So he started to do that. And I remember going over to Caltech. This was one of the most exciting things in my life. He had this new device at Caltech. He was a Caltech student, in fact. Uh, and he had got this atomic force microscope because DNA molecules can't be seen through a you know, regular microscope. And, but he could, you could see them now. And he had taken DNA strands that he thought, if he threw zillions of these strands in, they would wind each other, around each other and form like these big crystals or brick structures. Right? And so I was over at Caltech and Eric's doing his experiments and he's got his atomic force microscope and he's trying to use it and everything. And on the screen appear these bricks, just like his theory had said they should appear, right? And we were looking at them. So we were up here in the macroscopic world and these things were down there at the nanometer scale. And Eric was designing them up here and making them appear down there, right? And this became known as DNA self-assembly. And, uh, and it was really quite an amazing thing. Uh, suddenly, we had control of the nano world. I mean, we've been able to, you know, draw a 
plan for a house for a long time and then you get engineers and construction people and they build it and they'll build 20 copies if you mm -hmm. want, you know, we could do that. But now we could design stuff up here and have it take place at the nano world. And that sort of turned DNA computing on its head and self-assembly, what could you assemble, uh, started to become a real topic that grew out of it. And they assembled the great things. I, I don't know if this will work on camera, but then Paul, my other student, I always carry this with me. Uh, you probably can't see it. It's a picture of a nature mm -hmm. cover. And on it is a little yellow happy face. Okay. Now the thing about that happy face is, one, I'm very proud of Paul. He made it all by himself. Two, it uh, won him the MacArthur Award. And uh, because that's not a little diagram, that's an actual physical object, and it's about a hundred nanometers in diameter, uh, so like fifteen thousand of them or something could fit across a human hair, and uh, and it's made entirely of DNA. Paul designed some strands up here, got them made, you know, in tubes poured them all into a common tube, they came together and wrapped around themselves and formed that happy face, right? And he did it in a little drop of water in a half hour, they all assembled, and uh, there were 50 billion of those. And now this guy, these guys who are in this area, you know, Hugh, you know, I think people would like 50 billion statues of you made by DNA, <laughs> right? Not, not likely. <laughs> We can get it done, right? So it gave rise to all that, and it's really quite lovely. And, uh, you know, people sometimes ask me, well, you know, is DNA computing ever going to be, you know, practical computing? And uh, uh, the answer to that in one sense is no. Uh, electronic computing just is too advanced for us. We can't keep up. Okay. We did okay, but we couldn't. Mm -hmm beat out electronic computers. Um, and I also, there's this line I like, you know, it's not that the bear dances so well, it's that he dances at all. all, right? And so it's not that DNA is going to replace our supercomputers, but it computes. And that tells us biology computes, right? And you can look at biology mm -hmm. as computation. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and also, DNA computes in places that silicon can't, like inside of a cell. And so people are working on trying to find, use DNA computers to place inside cells to fight disease, deliver medicine, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So there will be ramifications of this stuff, uh, and they should be exciting. But another really nice, fun chapter. Yeah. Well, our students are like our children when we're yeah. professors. Uh, would you like to talk about some of your intellectual children? Well, I've had a number of uh, really brilliant intellectual children. I've spoken about Eric and Paul. Um, in addition, I've had some really brilliant theoreticians. Uh, I have one right now, uh, Joe Beeble, uh, really for you know, sort of raw intellectual power, he's, you know, as good as I've ever seen. And uh, I'm currently collaborating still with one of my other students, Rolf Schmidt. We're writing a paper on uh, digital currency mm -hmm. and uh, uh, making a surrogate for the United States physical currency, dollars and coins. And, uh, and I collaborate with uh, them and some others on another area that I'm currently working in, which is complex analysis. And uh, we're writing a book in that. But I've had a number of them, Dustin Reichus, uh, Henry Yoon. Uh, I, unfortunately, you know, I'll probably leave somebody out. But anyway, uh, I, I apologize. Brilliant guys. I mean, you know, we get to see, you know, the best, right? And uh, they're so brilliant and they're so wonderful to work with. 
uh, you know, and to watch them grow and to see their mm-hmm. lives and how they evolve. You know, they have all the troubles and difficulties mm-hmm. that every human has, but they also have these great gifts that, you know, make their lives much more exciting and I think wondrous than the average person. And I get to enjoy that vicariously and maybe give them some guidance, right? It's, it's, it's a blessing. It's wonderful. Um, what are you working on now? You said one thing about this thing, this project yeah. on analysis. Right. So I never liked analysis. Mm. You know, I never got it. Uh, but I've, I stumbled into it. And so for the last, like, 10, 15 years, I and my students have been immersed in complex analysis. And we sort of uh, made the decision that we would do complex analysis. We have a choice. We could stand on the shoulders of the giants. We could stand on Gauss's and Cauchy's and Riemann's shoulders. Or we could just try it ourselves, right? And so perhaps unwisely, we chose the latter, right? And the value of doing, I mean, the, the, the bad uh, you know, consequences of doing that is you don't know what they did, right? Uh, very little or what happened since then. The good thing is you go your own way, right? And so we've gone our own way and we've uh, created something we call strata theory and we are polishing a book which we've been polishing for the last seven years uh, it's about 230 pages. It's really a good book, and uh, it's complex analysis, strata theory, complex analysis. And uh, it fulfills a desire of mine, okay? Uh, because I, since the great mathematicians were always my heroes, uh, you know, and they all provided big bricks in the wall that we call mm-hmm. mathematics. You know, it's all built on it. But they, you know, they're at the foundation, right? And I've been blessed, you know, I put a few little ornaments on that tree. But I always wanted to at least have my little brick in that foundation. And uh, and this Strata book is my sort of legacy to mathematics. Because, uh, you know, complex analysis of the form we're doing uh, is also in a, in a sort of ember stage. It's not burning very brightly right now. There's brilliant people, just a few, a handful, that still do it. Uh, And it'll burn brightly again, I think. And I think when it burns brightly again, maybe people will come back and take my little brick and use it. And so, you know, that's one of the things I want to do. So I work hard on that. I'm trying to apply uh, what we've learned to some of the Hilbert problems without success. And uh, then I'm also working on uh, this paper with Rolf Schmidt, uh, which we hope will uh, give an alternative to Bitcoin and credit cards and everything for uh, an economic infrastructure as we move in more and more into Mm -hmm. the, the web. And we would like to think that our system will you know, provide a basis on which we can build a better economic future in the world, you know, that'll improve the lives of lots of people. And, uh, you know, and we think we've got a good system. So we're working Mm -hmm. on that. And uh, then the final thing I'm working on is a book, uh, which is about 125 pages and has been working on for a long time. It's on memes, okay. And not memes as they're currently used mm-hmm. on the, you know, internet. Mm-hmm. Not dancing babies or something. Uh, these go back to where the word comes from, which is Richard Dawkins. Mm-hmm. And in the 70s, Richard Dawkins produced this wonderful book called The Selfish Gene. And uh, it's mostly about genetics, but he mentions and these, I, these memes. And uh, memes are a generalization of genes. And in his hands, he, as I recall, um, he, he's thinking of them largely as sort of cultural ideas that can reproduce by passage to other brains and can evolve because we 
tend to change our ideas and interact mm -hmm. them with other ideas, and therefore an evolutionary system like genes. And when I read Richard's description, I said to myself, oh, that's how it all works. That's what's motivating and moving human beings in the same sense that the genes are moving and motivating biological organisms. And I've thought about this stuff for 40 years. And, uh, and so I'm writing down my thoughts. I wish I could have written a better book, but you know, given time constraints, I have to write down what I got. So uh, I'm enthusiastic about that as well. Okay. Right, any thoughts on retirement? No, I'm die at the desk kind of guy, right? <laughs> I wouldn't know what to do. I'm better at it now. Maybe I would know what to do, but no, I don't want to retire. Okay. So we finished the accomplishment section, unless there's something that I've left out? No, I can't think of anything. Okay, good. Can I uh, so let's go into the retrospective se uh, section. Okay. Actually, we're getting close to the end of my questions. Really? I, I, Believe it or maybe not. Is it a good time to take a break and then we can finish up? So who during, during your career were your role models? Oh, my role models. Gauss. Uh, I also thought that Newton and Einstein were pretty good. Uh, certainly Manuel Blum, my advisor. Mm -hmm. Certainly a role model. Uh, Dick Karp was a role model. Uh, Albert Meyer, who was a professor at MIT was a role mm -hmm. model. Um, who else? Was there anybody else? I thought Darwin was good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, right. Uh, Any uh, more that were closer to you? Oh, closer to me. Uh, okay, yes, uh, role models. Um, no, the three computer scientists I mentioned okay. were certainly role Oh, uh, I think in many ways there was a professor of logic called, his name was John Addison. He's still with us, I think, He's quite old. Um, and he was sort of inspirational to me. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a wonderful teacher and, and was the one that, you know, could present to me mathematics in a form that I could see its beauty, you know, that, that I could fall in love with, mm -hmm. right? If you don't cross that bridge, mm -hmm. get another job, right? You know, uh, and, and John had a lot to do with my crossing it. He showed me wondrous things. Looking back, what were the turning points or major decisions that led you to where you are today? Um, well, I've, I've mentioned that people played a part. Linda Kavner, um, uh, Martin Gardner, certainly. Mm -hmm. uh, but largely, my progress through mathematics was kind of characteristic of my progress through life. That is, I, I was just doing the things that fascinated me all the time. I just found that I, as time went by, I was in better and better company doing it, you know, or at least what was perceived as better company. You know, originally it might have been, you know, colleagues at school or kids in my classes, mm -hmm. you know, and stuff like that. But, you know, then, then as time went by, I never stopped what I was doing. It's just that I was in better places doing it, you know, at least I was getting paid more or, you know, like I'm at MIT, and I'm doing the same things I always did, but now it's with Ravest and Shamir, who are, you know, just great. And so, uh, I don't know, you know, the way it looked to me from the inside was just life going by, and right, and I find myself here and, and was in such fun places. Um, so, I don't I, Nothing comes to mind as a big turning okay. point other than those things I mentioned earlier. All right. What's the biggest regret in terms of decisions you've made? Ooh. Let me tell you the best decision I made, or one of the best, um, was to leave MIT. Okay. Uh, 
I was unhappy there. Uh, it was cold. Uh, I had just gotten my first divorce. I brought my beautiful German Shepherd with me and she got run over. Uh, I couldn't, uh, socially I felt out of place. I mean, with my friends I was okay, but I couldn't acclimate. You know, I'm not a very adventurous person. And uh, so I had to leave that place and it was a regret to leave it and it was a hard decision because it is a mecca of research. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a wonderful place for research. And, but I, I traded that off to come back to California where I felt comfortable. And, uh, and, and I, you know, Erdos, you know Erdos, mm -hmm. of course. And he's the most published author in the history of mathematics, I think. We all know our Erdos numbers and stuff like that. And when Erdos came to town as a young mathematician, you know, I'd be very excited. And, uh, but as I watched Erdos through time, I watched that he had sort of sacrificed his life to his discipline, to mathematics, right? And, and you know, he, he had no home. He had no family. His mother eventually died, right? Mm -hmm. And he just was this itinerant mathematician. And that's fine, you know, and he accomplished tremendous amounts, but it made me reflect on whether I wanted a life like that because I could see it in me to be that kind of person to always sit in the room and always do the mathematics. But I said, no, I, I want to have people in my life. I want to have a family. I want to have children. And, uh, and I, I thought that I wouldn't be able to do that very well in a place I wasn't comfortable in, Massachusetts. So I made a decision to go back. So that was one of the best decisions I ever made. Um, what were the bad decisions I made? decisions I regret. I don't like the way I, I, I have handled my uh, physical problems, uh, you know, mm -hmm. like the headaches or that, you know, back uh, problem that put me in a wheelchair. I don't like the way I handled them, but I just didn't know what to do. Um, made some bad decisions there. Um, Oh, here's another bad decision I made. I, I was so dedicated to mathematics that I w wouldn't allow myself to, to leave time for anything else. I didn't want to be encumbered by anything that would interfere with my ability to go sit mm -hmm. in the room and think. Mm -hmm. And uh, by making that decision, it was a very bad one because it cut me off from social relations, which I need very much in my life. And, uh, you know, cut me off from interaction with people and maybe exploration of things I would have found exciting and it would have enriched my life. But I made the decision to uh, try to cut all obligations so that I could study mathematics. Mm -hmm. And it led me to be isolated during certain parts of my life and it led me to be bored during certain parts of my life because I never had an obligation. So, uh, yeah, that didn't work out perfectly well, and I've reversed that somewhat mm -hmm. in my older age. What were your most important life lessons? Hmm. One I mentioned, you know, that, that whatever seems terrible mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is likely to be transient, not all the time, unfortunately, but likely to be transient even though you don't think so. Uh, another important life lesson for me is the importance of people and interactions and family. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, in many ways I'm sort of a on-off person. If I'm around people, if I'm interacting with people, I feel very much alive. If I'm by myself, I don't. And uh, you know, I've struggled with depression and math has been a, you know, uh, a relief from that because when I'm alone I do math. But that's been an aspect I've learned about myself. And, and you know, some very classical things that 
everybody's known or people have talked about for thousands of years. It's how you play the cards that life deals to you that is going to determine mm -hmm. how much joy or sadness or distress or whatever that you get out of life, right? It's not a free ride. It's very tough. But you can participate in the journey and you can steer it towards better or worse things. That's been an important lesson to me. Who was your proudest moment? Proudest moment? My mind turns to the birth of my children. That's what it comes down to, you know? Yeah. Right answer. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. As my, one, my do the daughter who lives with me says, you know, uh, we joke about it, you know, uh, um, a uh, Nobel Prize, right? And, she, and, and an acceptance speech. And she says, yeah, you know, y y when you get up there, so y you should say, you know, the most important two awards are the Nobel Prize, you know, that I've aspired to, are the Nobel Prize and Father of the Year. <laughs> you know, but Father of the Year is maybe a better one. Mm. What contributions, uh, contributions to computing are you proudest of or you think are the most significant? I think uh, the ones that will be remembered are cryptographic. But the ones I'm most proud of is my contribution to uh, algorithmic number theory and the fact that I, you know, got to sort of shepherd in this new concept of complexity theory and you know that should have ramifications for a long time in a field that I, is very dear to me so I think that's okay. the thing that's mm -hmm. most important to me. Are there any other interesting things that you worked on that we should talk about? Um, no. Oh, all right, good. And my job is done. Wow, great job, oh. you. That was wonderful. It was. Thanks so much for doing it. No, not a problem.